But just to give a brief sense of what it's about, for some of you who may not be familiar, I'm sure many, many of you will know about Mr. E.V. Ramaniti and Mr. Mamadi Khoshek. Mr. E.V. Ramaniti was one of the most distinguished civil servants of the state of Andhra Pradesh, the Australian state of Hyderabad before Andhra Pradesh was formed. Joined the Hyderabad Civil Service, then the IAS. A man of integrity, a man of deep commitment to public good, and a man who truly believed in the empowerment of citizens. In many ways, my journey in understanding public affairs and fighting for citizen empowerment began 40 years ago. And he was one of the first people to sow those seeds in a civil service which is almighty, which is proud, which is somewhat arrogant, distant, and dysfunctional. I was lucky, like many others, to be inspired by ideals well beyond the civil service structure and the permanent priesthood that it represents. Mr. Mamidi Bhojri, an outstanding citizen who 60 years ago, maybe even 70 years ago, was Zilla Parishad Chairman and then Hyderabad District before Ramaraji was formed, was District Cooperative President, a man of unimpeachable personal integrity, and therefore, quite logically in India, could not either continue in politics or rise in political life in this country. He chose to withdraw and he dedicated his life to empowerment of citizens and cooperative autonomy. The themes today, we all know, we are deeply concerned. We have to somehow energize our country. It's not enough to pretend that we are doing spectacularly well without creating the foundations for that. Therefore, the generic theme is, are we fitting the democratic dividend? And without proper education of quality accessible to every single child, irrespective of the circumstances of birth, I don't see how any of us can believe that they can be real fulfillment of our potential. So in the case of healthcare, I do not know there is a God. I keep telling people that I have a policy of mutual non-interference with God. If God doesn't bother about me, I don't bother about anyone. But I do believe that there is sin. I believe the two greatest sins are unfulfilled potential, the first one. If a child is endowed by nature or God, if you believe in God, with a certain potential, if that potential is not fulfilled in the form of education and the covering in the mind, to my mind, that is a sin. The second great sin is avoidable suffering. Dr. G. N. Rao, I inspired somewhere, Dr. Gopi Chen, another distinguished doctor, said here, one day we all have to pass. We are mortal. If it's natural, if it's after a full life, if it's not a preventable death, while it causes grief, beyond that, there's no point worrying too much about it. But if there is a preventable suffering, merely because the society did not figure out mechanisms, to address these challenges in this day and age, then that is a sin. Sadly, we are a country with the greatest amount of sin on both these counts. Luckily, and I'll conclude with this, luckily, we can do a great deal. Our demand side is very strong. Despite our poverty and illiteracy, our ordinary people, they want education. Our families are strong. They will to sacrifice almost anything for their children's welfare. We all belong to the stock, Hindu, Muslim, North, South, Upper Caste, Lower Caste, Andhra, Telangana. There's one common thing in every single family of this country. We live and we need to die for our children. We do whatever it takes to give them a head start in life. The poorest are spending disproportionate sums out of their pocket in order to give their children a head start. It's not the failure of the people of this country. So in the case of healthcare, Professor Jack Hammond will talk considerably about that. And we have some outstanding people who can make things happen if we do it the right way. In the field of healthcare, what the doctors sitting here and some of those outside, what they are doing, what they have done is extraordinary. When we were kids in medical school, many things we read in the textbooks, but they were simply not approachable, accessible to us. But today, 
a large number of things that were beyond our imagination are available with the same safety record as the best in the world and at the lowest possible cost, thanks to these great people. We have a pharma industry, which is a world champion. The lowest cost, high quality. We have many, many good things going for ourselves. Except that the Lula Sangat on the other I do not trust it enough. The one thing that matters, a governance model and a sensible policy framework that can actually deliver what is possible at a moderate cost. Now, whether the government delivers or the government makes it happen through some other means, it does not matter. We are agnostic about it. Professor Jeff Hammond is going to talk quite a great deal about that. And I'm sure there will be a very lively debate. Dan Pritchett, as I said, is on his way. He'll be joining us a little late. I now invite Sri Anil Nepur, a distinguished member of the board of the FDR, and a distinguished son of an eminent man in whose name the government takes his name to introduce his father briefly and Professor Jeff. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, JP. Good evening to all of you, and I'm very, very glad and very you know, honored that all, such a huge audience has come on such a distinguished gathering. So thank you very much for being here, and I'm sure my father will be very happy about this. <clears throat> my father, C. E. V. Ramadhi, was born into an agriculture family in Varangal district of Andhra Pradesh. He was at uh, earlier Hyderabad State. He was selected for the Hyderabad Civil Service in 1944 and was awarded the Sir George Gasson uh, Walker Gold Medal for standing first in his batch. He served as a distinguished member of the IAS for 37 years till 1981. While in service, Sri Ramadhi was well known for his integrity and doing the right thing irrespective of professional or personal consequences. Sri Ramadhi had a passion for protection of the environment. As Secretary of Forests, he was instrumental in saving thousands of acres of forests in Varangal and Hyderabad districts and later on played a leading role in the creation of the KBR Park in the middle of Hyderabad. Post retirement, he served for a brief period as an ombudsman called Dharma Mahamatra, a title which the then Chief Minister Edir Amaravaru wanted from the Ashoka days and was the title given at that time in the Ashoka days in Andhra Pradesh to oversee the employee apparatus charges against civil servants. He was also a passionate supporter of the cooperative movement and was the chairman of the Corporate Development Foundation, which has done pioneering work in strengthening of cooperatives across the country and creating an enabling legal environment for free functioning of cooperatives. He passed away in 1981. Let me say a few words I mean, for Professor Jeffrey Hammer. I know his violin is very long, but for the water time, I just put it pretty, very small. Jeffrey Hammer is a Charles and Murray Robertson District Professor of Economic Development in the Woodrow Wilson School at Princeton University where he teaches economic development and economics of health policy in poor countries. Prior to this, he worked for 25 years at the World Bank, where he concentrated on various issues related to public economics, public expenditures, and the social sectors, particularly here. His current research is on the quality of medical care in India, absenteeism of teachers and health workers, the determinants of health status, and improving service delivery through better accountability mechanisms. His BA is from Swarthmore College and PhD from MIT, and both are economics. Thank you very much. <laughs> Professor Hammer, thank you for taking the trouble to come all the way. Uh, though I suspect that a visit to Hyderabad is very pleasant after Kettle. By the way, still not as good as we should be by Indian standards, we are one of the best global cities. Thank you for taking the trouble and please make your presentation, which I know you will be very feisty, thoughtful, stimulating.
Um, well, thank you very much uh, for, for inviting me, um, for, for having us. I'm well, actually quite daunted by the uh, eminence of the uh, of, of the audience. I'm used to facing students who sort of happy to listen to me. Uh, um, so we'll see how we do with uh, 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 more voluntary. Um, I'm very happy to uh, that the uh, subject of this, of this session is on governance. Because I think that a lot of the things that are wrong with the health sector in India and have always been have really been uh, decisions on government in, a, in very particular ways. Just to lay out my all the cards on the table early on is I think we've been trying to do a little bit of everything, a little too much of everything, and not really concentrating on things that are most important. So. I've uh, titled this talk, Picking Your Battles, from a high uh, setting priorities in health, and I mean that seriously, that it is doing some things much more, and that may come at the expense of doing other things somewhat less. It sounds banal, but wait until you see uh, uh, how India is done. So I, I don't know who this guy is. I ran into I ran into his name. He seems like a nice little walk. Um, uh, and he had this very he had a, a a good thing to say. Notice it was 1926. Uh, it's the important thing for government is not to do things which individuals are doing already, and to do them a little better or a little worse, but to do those things which at present are not done at all. Now the economists in the audience will say, "Oh, he's talking about public goods." for the non-economists, um, a public good is something that if the government doesn't do it, it will not get done, period. So if, if the government doesn't put in sewers in the city, there is no private enterprise, maybe some exception somewhere, um, that will do it. Um, in India, I've worked there for quite some time, um, sometimes the term public good uh, means something that I, the speaker, happen to think the government should do, not the uh, the more specific uh, comment of uh, if the government doesn't do it, it's gone. Um, now I want to stick to this just a little bit more, even though uh, it might drag me over time. This is 1926. This is uh, Keynes talking about the end of laissez-faire. We're, I think we're going to end up at the same midpoint, um, but we're coming from really different ends. In 1926, in England, there was still the idea that the government had virtually no role at all. That's why I was discussing the end of laissez-faire. In fact, in 1916 was, all, was, the, was when they made secondary school up to probably 10th standard, 16 years old, something like that, mandatory. 1916, something that we think of as an absolutely essential government function, they only had just introduced when he uh, was talking about this. So he's starting from when the world is way, way right to me. And he wanted to say, no, no wait a minute. The, the, the government has a few legitimate things to do. Uh, and wanted to make sure that we were not sticking with a pure laissez-faire economy. I'm going to end up with the same conclusion that he had, but I think we're starting from the other side, which is the government thinks everything is their responsibility, and um, we sort of have to come the other way, which is sort of pare down some of the things that governments do, making sure that we do those very essential things. So he starts in a world that's very right wing, wants to bring us uh, into more government responsibility. We're starting with a world with a lot of government responsibility, and maybe we should uh, take a second look on exactly what we think is important. I only have, in fact, I could talk about education, I suppose. I won't. But, but, <laughs> I only have two things to say about any policy. Really, any policy ever. First, provide public goods before private goods. Now, I extend that a little bit 
a pure public good is really hard to find. But there are uh, lots of things, and in economics textbooks, there are usually in chapter three, or, you know, after you get a little introduction, uh, things that, fr that the free market just does very bad. So the worst thing, of course, is the pure public good, meaning the private sector doesn't do it at all. But there's also things like communicable disease control, where if you cure one person, you actually prevent the infection of someone else. So you're trying, so you do it. The, the people choosing to, to cure themselves are only taking their own responsibility, their own problems into account, and not really taking into account their effects on others. Tuberculosis is actually fairly good. Um, uh, that's called an externality. You don't have to know. But there's also anti-monopoly efforts. Uh, and uh, a, a few others. I'm going to focus primarily on the public goods and the externalities because communicable diseases is a big is a big deal. Okay, um, or one and one other than so a little bit more subtle. So fix really bad market failures first. There's no such thing as a perfect market, but some markets are imperfect in spectacularly awful ways, and some things are not perfect. I don't think there's ever a really perfect market. Okay. The second thing, no, so the first one you will get in any economics textbook by chapter three. It's very uh, standard, but there's a sort of an assumption that once you find this market failure, the government instantly and seamlessly and smoothly jumps right in and fixes it. <clears throat> So it's the job, they say, the job of the economist is to find out where the markets are going wrong, and then right away the government's going to come in and, and set it right. To that, I'd like to add a little bit of an addendum, which is, why don't you do the things you can do before you start trying to do those things that you really can't? So that it's possible that it's difficult for the markets to do some things, but it's also possible that it's difficult for governments to do some things as well. I hope I don't hurt anyone's feelings by noting that sometimes implementation in Indian policies isn't quite up to the mark. Would that be a fair uh, assessment? So that in order to think of the proper governance of policies and health, we should go after the most important problems, and we should take the implementation constraints on government that are generated by government capacities very seriously. We should not just say, oh, the market's doing this thing wrong, therefore we will nationalize it, or something like that. We are a little ways away from uh, the worst days of, of that, but there's still quite a sense that you find a problem, government will fix it. <coughs> Let me see if we can uh, examine that a little bit. In health, I'm getting around to health by five, ten minutes, I think. Uh, I believe it's quite, sort of a simple argument. Some health policies address massive market failures, and some don't. Um, real public health, that is, the kinds of traditional, traditional in the Western sense, traditional public health of the 19th century, soon after Louis Pasteur figures out the germ theory of disease, uh, governments were limited in what they were, well, actually limited in what they were capable of doing because there were practically no useful medicines at all. What they did do is they put in the sewer systems, uh, they made sure that they drained swamps, uh, they made the environment uh, much cleaner for, the cities was where the big problem was, but everywhere. Um, and they were fairly restricted in what they could do uh, and focused quite specifically on safe water and sanitation. Mostly because doctors had no drugs. Sulfur drugs fell off in 1937, uh, antibiotics fell off in 1949. So in the late uh, 19th century, it was mostly um, a prevention. The other big market failure, this one's a little bit more subtle, um, is Public insurance, and I'm going to discuss the role of hospitals here, uh, health insurance markets fail virtually everywhere at all times uh, and are needed essentially for protecting people from catastrophic loss. 
Well, because you, you know, from, I'm from the United States. If it wasn't for the United States, every country in the world would be complaining about their health system. Uh, and I think the reason why they're not is they say, oh yeah, there's this problem, there's that problem, but at least we're not in the United States. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, so, and the reason for this is that for a variety of reasons, don't have to go into the details, it's really hard to, for health insurance markets to, to evolve in the private sector. Now you might be thinking, oh, well, we've always had uh, some health insurance here, but for the vast, vast majority of people in, in India, there was no private market um, for health insurance, and for very good systematic reasons. Uh, fraud is too easy, um, so an insurance company wouldn't get into it. Uh, only sick people might choose to have insurance, which drives up the cost. There's a lot of reasons for this, but th there was always under provision of of health insurance. In fact, sometimes I've been to a country much poorer than India, and I would say something like this, and they would give me this blank look and say, Dr. Hammer, what are you talking about? We have no health insurance market. I'm saying, exactly. That's as bad as you can, a market failure as you can get uh, of having the market disappear altogether. Whenever we have surveys of poor people in India, uh, it may not be the first one every single time, but in most of these surveys, the things that people are most worried about for people is that something might happen, someone might get sick, they might be faced with a hospital bill, and life could get really hard from then on. Uh, I know that it's illegal and everything, but I've heard tale of even as bad as bond and labor. I mean, the consequences are serious if you have to face a giant hospital bill. And if you don't have insurance, you're scared all the time. So some people think that insurance is only for when you get sick. I don't think so. Uh, insurance is what makes you comfortable that you do not have to be afraid of everything. Um, and, that the, and the fact that there is no market is a terrible blow to human well-being. Now this is where you're going to get upset. I'm thinking of what's the market failure in primary health care, and I'm scratching my head and thinking, well, it can't be a public good because it's a gigantic private sector. So right, I mean, it can't be a public good because there's a gigantic private sector. So right away, that's not it. And then there's some stories about doctors can talk you into uh, do, doing more than you really need, or they can overcharge, or something like that. I'm thinking, yeah, maybe. But the kinds of things that you go to primary health care centers for are paracetamol, and maybe some malaria medicine, or maybe an antibiotic here and there, which, in fact, you could probably buy at the little non um, booth in little villages. Uh, they'll sell uh, thumbs up, and they'll sell monkey, and they'll sell paracetamol, and they'll pay. To, they'll sell little boxes of juices, and they'll buy, and they'll be selling antibiotics, and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, et cetera. Um, and so, the exactly what goes wrong there is a little bit more of a question. You can yell at me later. Some health policies are particularly important for the poor, and some are not. Uh, I would say. And in thinking of human, uh, sort of human development of children, infectious disease control is still a big deal. The WHO keeps talking about dual burden and we're passing into the demographic, but the health transition. I think it's way too early to give up on the kids and that we really have to worry about infectious disease control. Infectious diseases affect the poor way disproportionately more than non-communicable diseases. Uh, WHO seems to think that non-communicable diseases actually go up with income, that's wrong. Uh, it, it, it come, that poor people suffer from everything more than uh, rich people, but just not quite the same. For tuberculosis, the last time this was measured in India, the very poorest people were seven times more likely to have uh, tuberculosis than uh, the richest people. Malaria was like four to one, and, so, and things like cataracts were more like three to two. So if you really wanted to go after, to use public money to help poor people, you really wanted to go after the communicable diseases. So market failure, helping the poor. Some health policies are hard to implement. Like I'm going to recommend, like build sewer systems in uh, 
cities. That's not easy. But some health policies are even harder than that. Um, which uh, I, uh, people who have managed doctors, some of you might be doctors yourselves, sorry, um, uh, have a liking this to herding cats, and that uh, it's very difficult to uh, uh, make sure that doctors do exactly what the policy uh, designer did. And in fact, by forgetting that doctors are real people, I think some of the policy designers think they did a very perfect job in this design, but if you can't implement it, it's not that great a design. So, my conclusion for all, and uh, actually from now on, if you ever want to say anything else, you to After this slide, I'm happy to keep myself up, keep quiet. I say policy should be strategic, not covering the whole waterfront, and get the most welfare improvement possible. Welfare includes deaths, of course, on the communicable diseases, but also financial protection on the hospital side, so welfare is a broader measure. Uh, relative, and all of this has to be relative to what would happen without the policy. Um, that was the no one no sewers except the government kind of story. Uh, so you want the most welfare improvement for public rupee spent with those implementation constraints fully considered. So sometimes we can dream up beautiful looking policies uh, but if we don't realize that a lot of the times they simply won't be implemented exactly the way they're planned, that policy can go way, way, way wrong. So maybe it wasn't quite as simple as the uh, original said, but, it's, uh, but that is my main point. In any case, shouldn't we get a handle on some of this before we spend a lot more money on, oh, just picking one out of hand, randomly out of the air, uh, universally publicly provided primary care? And shouldn't we know a lot more about the many varied determinants of health before we spend large sums of money on anything? Um, health is way more than education. Uh, determined by a billion different things. Uh, the biggest ones I think of are in people's incomes and maternal education. Mothers are the first line of defense against uh, disease, and if they're educated and have some resources to, to spend on it, they're the, the first people to uh, work on it. And, and whenever we do big studies, let's say with the National Family Health Survey or the National Sample Surveys, the things that come up every single time are standard of living, and women's education. But anyway, shouldn't we know some of this stuff? Shouldn't this be incorporated in our planning and design and thinking of what our policy should be? Apparently not. I'm not going to go through this. Um, but here is a, a bunch of uh, reports and statements and policy positions and uh, what not, starting from the Board of Commission re Committee Report of 1946. And what did he say? He said that there should be an integrated integration of curative and preventive medicine at all levels with seamless referrals from primary, from subcenters to primary centers to CHCs to district hospitals. And there should be very specific staffing per capita requirements for each level. Does that sound at all familiar to any of you? <laughs> yeah, it, uh, things have not changed a whole lot. Uh, a few years later, I don't know who uh, uh, Mr. McDonnell was, uh, but he noticed that uh, primary health care centers around the country, yeah, they weren't really working very well. But what was his solution to it not working very well? Let's spend more money. Actually, this happened, uh, small slide. Uh, on the 30th anniversary of the Alma Ata Declaration, where the World Health Assembly and then the World Health Organization pushed very hard for primary health care, it sounded a lot like the Board Commission report. In fact, I think India has influenced the world way more than the world has influenced India, because uh, it really sounded exactly like that. But the uh, Director General of the WHO at the time said, yeah, we have 30 years of experience now with primary health care. It's not it really didn't work out quite the way we think. And the conclusion for that? Spend more money. Then we get this one and that one and this one and that one. 
I was living in Delhi in 2005. Uh, so both the midterm review of the Penn plan and the NRHM, the National Rural Health Mission, happened at approximately the same time. Um, and uh, sent over to the World Bank, I was working for the World Bank, uh, for some comments, and they gave, why they gave it to me, I'm not sure. But um, uh, I said, you know, it's interesting, you have all kinds of goals for the National Rural Health Mission, um, uh, and conclusions from the midterm review, uh, as long as you're going to start this gigantic project, maybe we should know what's going on now. Maybe we should have a baseline. They, uh, the, the response was, well, you know, there's a National Family Health Survey uh, just a couple years before, but the National Family Health Survey is mostly about family planning, which was not a big thing in the uh, NRHM and has almost nothing on any other health uh, problem and very little at all about how people decide to seek care from one place or another. So in fact, that was not a baseline. There was barely little information that was relevant um, there. So I suggested, yeah, maybe someone should like start looking at people's real health problems, not just the not, not just the funnel, and uh, and how people handle their own illness. That didn't happen. Uh, then there was the high level expert group, the preliminary report uh, in uh, January in the Lancet, and then uh, the full report later in November. Uh, don't bother with this, but uh, uh, the, way that I uh, the way that I read the thing that I thought was most interesting about this was the conclusion was to reorient, to focus significantly on primary health care while guaranteeing secondary and tertiary care. Now, from my perspective as an as an economist, where we're trying to make decisions between what's better and what's worse, that was we're not doing anything, um, or we're not doing anything different. It really was we will try everything; they're all the same. Uh, and I would like to show that that may not be true. Uh, the last line is a little bit of insulting, and I won't uh, uh, go into it. But geez. <laughs> The kinds of things we hear about public policy now sound an awful lot like the Board Commission report if there were copy machines in 1946. So let me take a, I'm going to go through the primary health care problems quicker because I, I don't think I'll have enough time to go through uh, the details. But since it figures so prominently in India's health policy, let's start with primary curative health care. How's it doing? Okay, so I was visiting, I, I'm here a lot of the times, and most summers, and I wish I could, could stay away from summers, but um, I was visiting at the uh, Valley School of Economics, a friend of mine, um, uh, Rohini Somanathan, and she jumped, comes into my office and says, Jeff, there's a big celebration in the uh, auditorium about the success of the National Rural Health Mission. This is in 2013, that's eight years after I said maybe we should have a baseline. And so I was scratching my head and saying, huh, I wonder what they're going to say uh, on the great success of the National Rural Health Mission. Um, so there were three speakers, uh, Secretary of Health, Principal Secretary of Health, um, the person on the, on the erstwhile planning commission who was in charge of health. Fortunately, I don't remember his name, so it, you know, I'm getting older, and, uh, so I can't be personal slander. And then there Anyway, we don't want to. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, another prominent person who was actually in charge of the evaluation quote unquote. So they said that it was a great success. They all three of them said the same things. What was the evidence for the great success of the National Rural Health Mission? We spent more money. We hired more workers. Uh, we increased the capacity of the states. Uh, this should have come in three different steps. Now, I would have always been kind of interested in the Bintani Raj institution, so I thought, oh, if increasing the capacity of the states, that's kind of interesting. What are they going to say? And it turned out they spent more money and they hired more. So, is the purpose of health policy to employ medical providers? It is, is a uh, national uh, employment guarantee scheme for health workers? Actually, some of my more cynical friends in Delhi say, yeah, it's kind of that's what it is. But I don't, I'm not that cynical. 
uh, is the person who needs to spend money? And they, I say no. They said, yeah, maybe it's to buy phones or something like that. I didn't want to get that cynical. I thought the whole point was to improve the health and well-being of the people of India, not to take tax money, which could very well be paid by very poor people, because it's indirect tax, more economics. We don't know who pays the taxes. It could very well be very poor people. And spend it on their own behalf to make them better off. You have to be pretty sure of that uh, before you uh, take the money away from them. In any case, there's no one-to-one -one relationship between the spending and the employment and getting something for it. The, the connection has to have some empirical support. And the evidence is not overwhelming. This happened earlier. There's another column to the left. Uh, this is, sorry. If, if, if you don't know any statistics, close your eyes. I think I'll think I can explain this. This is a bunch of tests of what's the effect of having a primary, a primary health care center near you from the National Family Health Service surveys on infant and child mortality, or under two mortality and two to five mortality of occurs in the United And there were a whole bunch of not significant relationships that were in the right direction. That's the flawless one. Not significant. A lot of things that were not significant in the wrong direction, that's the second highest one. There's a one off to the side, which is significant ones in the right direction, and off to the gray rate are significant effects in the wrong direction, meaning it was saying you have a primary health care center and it does you harm. I do not believe that. What I believe is, if you know some statistics, this looks to me like something not quite normal distribution around zero, with exactly the right number of uh, observations at 5% significance. Sorry, I've been uh, going to get that over. Um, exactly the right number of coefficients that you would expect to come out significant, even if there was no effect in reality. And on the left side, it was exactly the same. So let me go past this. What we had, the only data we had, showed no effect. And uh, another thing, and this is for possibly for another day, um, you could ask the question, why exactly do we have is the, the most recent data point on this 1998? And that's because that was the last survey that asked both, was there an available health, uh, health uh, post near you, and uh, something about your health status. After that, the National Family Health Surveys dropped the question about the location of the facilities, and we have no idea whether this persisted over time. So there's a data question, we'll come, we can skip that. I'm very angry at that data. But how can this be? How can publicly provided medical facilities not help? Well, one is that the public sector is very small relevant to the market as a whole. Um, and it, the market as a whole is of extremely varying quality. Uh, and there seems to be a lot of substitution among people between where they go to get their health care. They shop around, they go to, uh, they go to a, um, an informal provider, that doesn't work. They go to the PHC, that doesn't really work. They go to a real private MBBS doctor, maybe that works, maybe that doesn't work. Uh, in any case, there's a lot of shifting around, meaning that if you improve one of those, it's possible that you'll just take away from the other. And therefore, we should know what's the relative quality of the private sector if you happen to improve the primary, public primary health care sector. That because you're just a small player, and if you're just substituting for something that's already being done, like Kane said, um, that's of limited value. That's one. The other one is, what exactly comes out of the public sector anyway? Uh, this one I'm going to skip real fast. This is my evidence that, uh, uh, again, look at the data. I'll bring our data in a second. Uh, it, this is from the uh, NSS data every 10 years on health module. If you look at the one that has an arrow coming to it, it's like everybody, no matter what your income level is, goes to the private sector for primary care. So 80%. It was 80% in 1985. 
It was 80% in 1995, it was 80% in 2000, and probably doesn't know what the income level was, and it's 80% in 2015. No change whatsoever. Hospitals, uh, it's a little bit different. People can't afford private hospitals as much as, and therefore there's, there's more use of, uh, of uh, um, uh, public sector. But in any case, you have to keep in mind that most people are going to the private sector. Why don't people use free public care with qualified doctors? You have to have an MBBS to be assigned a doctor as a PhD uh, instead of to be put to be uh, variably trained is uh, responsible Ayurveda's, responsible Unani, uh, you know, Ayush uh, kind of providers, but it also includes a lot of pure quacks. So it's a very wide, uh, wide range. Um, if I've been to lots of secretaries of health um, offices in lots of states, and I and uh, this comes up, and sometimes they act like they're surprised that there's so much private sector. They must know in the back of their heads or not. I brought a bunch of students to an important but not very not large, not very large uh, state in northern India, uh, and uh, it was on health care. They were doing an independent study, and they asked the director of medical services of this particular state the very question um, because and they showed him the most recent NSS uh, results and uh, this is a quote it stood up it stood out so uh, brightly in my in my memory he said because they're ignorant peasants my students all turned to me with the jaws laughing and uh, staring at me, saying, did he really say that? Uh, he really said that. But let's ask a different question. What do people find when they get to PhD? We're going to go through these real fast. One is, uh, this one could just be a budgetary problem. I don't know, uh, so I'm not going to put too much emphasis on it. But there's a lot of vacancies. So when they get to PhDs, there might not be a doctor there, uh, which is important to them, because they want to be a doctor. Uh, uh, but this is percentage of staff positions vacant. You might think, oh, we just don't spend enough on health because we could just fill those vacancies. Maybe. But uh, there's also the case that there's a lot of doctors hanging around state capitals waiting for an assignment where there are, in fact, these vacancies in places they don't want to serve, and they're just waiting around until they get a better assignment. I do not know how many people that represents. There's never been a study on this, as far as I know, certainly not a national study. But everybody kind of thinks something like that is going on. Oh, that maybe it might just be a one minor problem. But even if there's a, there are vacancies, there's frequently absentee rates. This is uh, one of the numbers on this. So this is a podium of the states. Uh, four to the left, this is the right, the first one is the car, second one is dark time. Um, and uh, way to the right is uh, a um, and this is, um, and sorry, this, I can tell you, the mean, the average of all of these is 40%. Okay, for, in fact, uh, yeah, 40% uh, national average. This is divided up by why they said uh, they weren't there. We sent surprise people. It was very easy survey to do. We knew who was supposed to be there. We sent someone there that just surprised the character who was there. Not too difficult. Um, but not too difficult, but not done either. Um, and uh, if no one was there, we'd ask the Chucky Dar or somebody, you know, why didn't Dr. Saab here and blah, blah, blah. And uh, we took down whatever they said. Some of it must have been nonsense because some of this is official duty and leave, and this is representing three days a week or something. I mean, it's an enormous amount of obviously false information. Absentee rates. Doctors aren't there because of vacancies, because of absentees. What, what, who is there and what are they doing? I don't want to go into this study too much. Jishmi uh, Dawson and I did the study first in Delhi. And uh, the study is in two parts. The first part is we go in and we ask uh, vignettes, which are hypothetical cases um, on five very common uh, problems. Uh, the, the, there's always two people, one who acts like the patient, or in the case of the mother with diarrhea, with a, mother with a child with diarrhea, uh, one pretends to be the mother, 
and one pretends to be someone who can answer questions like how the test results uh, came out, which of course the patient would know. Um, we did this for all kinds of doctors, from the quacks, one of whom was, uh, he's, he was part-time uh, because his main job was working in a ball bearing factory that was on our lowest end. And we also had um, uh, senior MBBS doctors who had retired from public service who were consultants to major hospitals on the other end, and outpatient departments in um, uh, some of the more prestigious hospitals. The, the blunt on the right, is the private MBBS doctors and the people in the outpatient uh, departments of the, of the big public hospitals. The, the lump on the left, that's the blue one, those were all of the, uh, this is a distribution, so I just want to talk about everybody, people uh, with all of these variable qualifications, higher grades or not, et cetera, et cetera, and the doctors in public primary health care centers in Delhi. Now, two friends of ours did, did similar studies in Indonesia and Tanzania, uh, but they have limited it to actual real doctors in public facilities. So, in fact, they're quite comparable to our second lump. The pop, Indonesia is a little bit richer than India and comes out looking a little bit better. Tanzania is a little bit poorer than India, substantially poorer than India, and they come out looking a little bit worse. But other than that, that fits pretty well. They didn't measure any of our any of our parts. In any case, uh, a lot of this means that they they were getting some of the simple things wrong just from these hypotheticals. The second thing that we looked at was for the same doctors, we would send someone in to watch what they do. So one is, what do they know? And the other one is, what do they actually do? Doing is a little bit tricky sometimes. Uh, sometimes we just have students marking down what happened. In more sophisticated version, mostly just who did this, they, they, they trained uh, actors to go in to act like particular problems, that they had particular problems so they could control for the actual case. Uh, that, was, that was better, but that, that was better. But, uh, um, so, but that way you can tell what exactly do they do. So one of the things that they do is not very much. <laughs> so the blue line is, uh, the, the x-axis is how much time did someone spend uh, with the patient, and the blue line shows how what fraction of uh, a checklist of standard things did the doctor actually ask. And as you can see, early on, you ask the first few minutes, they get a lot of information. There's, there's another picture which is also more, takes my word for it, the more questions you ask, the more likely you're going to get the right answer. That's not too surprising. Um, so they, uh, it's, the first few minutes are, are very important, and then it kind of tapers off once the doctor basically knows what's going on. How much time do they spend? So that's, that, that's how much time, what would happen if they spent this time, but how much time do they actually spend? That's the orange distribution, the mean of which is about three and a half minutes. But that's including a bunch of people who have 10 minute, 15 minute intervals. The median, if, uh, in which is half above, half below, was uh, much closer to two. And the mode, which is the highest point of the distribution, was one minute. Just for comparison, in Germany they've done a study like this, and the average interaction with a doctor-patient was six minutes, but, which um, doesn't look all that great, but that was after a nurse had taken all your vital signs, your height, your weight, your blood pressure, your blood test, whoa, 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 whoa. And that could have taken 15, 20 minutes. So it, in fact, it's way off the charts. Uh, it's, it's in the next room. Uh, so, well, how, what does low effort mean? This is back to the Delhi study. Uh, low effort in our study was almost exactly coincident with public primary health care doctors. Um, and that was less than two minutes, so fairly complicated comparable to the rural study that I just showed you. Just one question. What do you think the question was? So somebody comes into a doctor and the question that the doctor asks is? 
But there's a lot of a variety of ways you could phrase that. You could say, oh, I'm sorry you're not feeling so well today. What may I do to help? That would be one way of asking it. But when we debriefed our, our interviewers, um, the, the most common uh, answer was Kahe. And I'm not an indie speaker, but I'm told that's not a particularly nice way to phrase the exact same problem. Uh, this is a time, it's the same, oh, people call us, oh, oh, that's just that way, we're going to rural areas, it's entirely different, we went to rural areas, it's not entirely different, this is a label talking to me, it says the same thing. Um, not that kind of stuff. And it's not because they're too busy, it's they're not spending one minute with each patient because there's this gigantic line outside, they were not really that busy. So, <laughs> So the, the average was of actually seeing patients was 39 minutes per day, and by weird coincidence, maybe it's a constant of nature, uh, the World Bank in their institutional lab, whatever studies of um, their service delivery indicators, uh, have almost exactly the same number in Tanzania and Senegal. Um, and the, the, what these bars are is we we listed all of the doctors by how much time they spend with patients. We took the fifth percentile, that means not very busy, and the 90th percentile, which was very busy. And then we just took that, that chart out and looked to see when this person was doing stuff uh, uh, during the day. And as you see, it, even the very busy public sector um, uh, uh, worker was putting in a you know, couple hours is good. Um, but it's not like uh, he was zipping through all of his other patients because there was this long line waiting. I'm going to skip this entirely, but there's a whole literature that we're working on now is what exactly is it? What, what explains this? When we ask hypotheticals, MBBS doctors get things right almost all the time. And, uh, and in fact, they, they, they spend a fair amount of time with our interviewer. But when you actually go like, in, uh, to either just sit in their office and, and mark down times, or you send in that actor, uh, they do way, way, way less than we know that they should do, because they answered the hypothetical exactly right. Um, so this is a, uh, and so some of the questions are exactly why uh, is that? That's what I just said, right? Yeah. Um, I don't think I want to go into this part because the picture's a little weird. Uh, but what this, is, what this does show for both public and EDS doctors, the green part is what they, on the left, the green part on the left is what they did in the hypothetical. And the one on the right in each pair is what they did in practice. Notice that public and EDS doctors did quite well. They got almost everything right. The, sorry, the public MBBS doctors did quite well. They got almost everything right. And the private MBBS doctors did, in fact, get everything right. But when you actually were seeing patients, you get a different picture. And if you're really picky about whether or not the doctor should be doing exactly the right thing and nothing else, you should be worried about the the green line. And you notice that for the public MBBS, the green it is almost the same as the people who do not have MEBS. That's from my well, very factory worker all the way to a responsible Ironman. This is totally incomprehensible. People, uh, don't look at it, I'll tell you what it is. Um, people have been complaining about the, over, the misuse of antibiotics. Uh, and a lot of times when you talk to government officials, they'll say, oh yeah, yeah, it's that private sector. It's particularly those cracks that are just over misusing uh, antibiotics all over the place. It's their fault. The, four, um, the, the, the last set of columns on the right is, the, is about using, sorry, prescribing an antibiotic for a case of asthma, which everybody knows was not a good idea. 
So it was a, a long thing to do. However, the other thing to note is public, private, MBBS, non MBBS, it doesn't matter. They're all doing it at exactly the same rate. It's, and in fact, the, the dark blue line, which is public primary health care doctors, is 32%, and the light green line, which is non MBBS doctors, is 32%. The difference is very small. Okay, so back to the original question. What do people find when they get there? Well, there's no doctors because there are uh, vacancies. There's no doctors because sometimes they're absent. It's not clear what they know. Uh, or at least a, a good chunk of them, it's not clear what, what, what they know. It's clear that they're putting in very little effort. Um, and it looks like there isn't a whole lot of difference between the public primary health care and MBBS doctor and your traditional healer in the, in the village. Who could be a, who's your neighbor who actually cares whether or not they're, I mean, it's, they're not trying to hurt you or anything. They're usually someone in the community, they're doing the best they can. They may not know much, but whatever, they're doing the best they can. And it turns out uh, it's not a whole lot different than they get from the healthcare center. So in contrast to my direct, director of medical services, who said they're all ignorant peasants, I think they know exactly what's going on and are making a reasonably good choice, or a choice that's specified. Okay, that was my uh, rant. You would, you're probably thinking, uh, all I wanted to do was uh, dump on the Indian health system. Uh, that is absolutely not true. I think you've been treating me very unfairly if you thought that. Um, the, uh, uh, well, believe it or not, this is an optimistic presentation. There are some things that are pretty sure to improve the health of the, of the Indian people, and particularly the poor. Uh, and some of it is the original plan of rich countries to, to do the true traditional public health goods had not been done. It is bizarre beyond belief that Delhi is covered almost negligibly by a sewer system that leads to a treatment plant. Why do we think that there's, that there's going to be a lot of foreign direct investment and businesses are going to be really interested in bringing their staff to the cities and producing jobs and getting us rich and so on and so forth? When they come to Delhi and they see what's going on, and I didn't even mention air pollution, um, it doesn't make for a good impression. And these days, and I, along with so this, the spring water and sanitation is pollution of the water, but in recent years, we you know that the pollution of the air is the same problem. And who's gonna fix air pollution except the government? What private businessman could possibly do that? And how could he get paid for it? That's why it's a public good. Um, and we are simply not doing it. Um, then there's pet, uh, vector control, pest control. Sorry, is not a direct segment. It's, a, uh, it's something that carries Z. Mosquitoes, rats, snails, black flies, <coughs> and how do you, there's lots of ways of getting rid of them. Sometimes it's draining swamps. Who will drain a swamp if not the government? Nobody. Uh, one of the things that I always thought was interesting is I was here when they were uh, building the um, it was the uh, sorry. Uh, they were building. It was the residential quarters for for medical students at Ames. There was this gigantic hole in the ground. There was a dengue outbreak in. Uh, that summer that I happened to uh, have been there and watching and seeing the you know, big hole in the ground. And they traced the epicenter of the dengue uh, epidemic of that year. Guess where? To the ponds at the bottom of the hole that they built for the medical students at Ames. <laughs> so I thought of that as pretty good symbolism for some of the things wrong with 
uh, the, the health priorities in India. We were worried about how to uh, train the elite doctors. We were not worried about whether or not we got rid of the sleep. Uh, these, the first ones are things that um, rich countries did too. And in fact, the mortality rates in rich countries came down way, way, way fast to about levels that we're seeing in India now, 100 years ago. And that was before that doctors did anything useful except surgery. Fiber. Oh, good. But now we have a whole bunch of other things that uh, are available to us. Immunization. Some people argue, is it a public good or is it a private good? Here's a good example of whether it's a public good or a private good, I really don't care. It's easy. So even, even if you could make some philosophical argument that the private sector should do it, forget it. It's easy enough, just go and immunize people. What I am a little concerned about is um, polio having taken away some of the pressure for some of the more important immunizations, because um, some of those have stagnated even as we uh, we'll probably have a definitely different discussion. I'm not going to go through this in great detail. We did a study in Delhi um, uh, on uh, whether hygienic conditions are, uh, uh, translate into health. And uh, basically, there were three factors. Does water come into your house sometime during the year? And in the neighborhoods that we were talking about, if water came inside your house, that means it went over the open ditch in front of your house. And whatever was in there was probably brought into uh, your house, and that's water getting into your house. There's, does anybody, this is a city now, does everybody, uh, does anybody ever defecate the open? And then to get at some of this extra now, does any of the neighbors, do any of the neighbors defecate the open? Just to compare uh, the numbers that come out. Okay. Uh, <laughs> um, We'll just compare the one. Okay. We'll compare the one way on the left where nothing goes wrong, to the one on the right where everything goes wrong. And we'll just look at infants. And uh, it looks it, actually it's pretty bad because in the low-income neighborhoods, this is in a two-week period. Uh, the first bar should be labeled 13% of the people of children had diarrhea in the two-week period. So like that's pretty bad, and that's in our better case. In our bad case, it, it translates into seven or eight bouts of diarrhea per year. I'm not a doctor, but I think that could kill me. And it was definitely more born diseases, not, not because they were poor, because it didn't show up in any other kind of disease. Uh, skip this. We rural areas. This was, this was a, a study on the total sanitation campaign before spot <laughs> Uh, and it looked, we're trying to convince people to change their behavior. It looked like it worked, but I won't go into the uh, details. The thing I'd like to end on is where I started, um, which was insurance markets. Are, so we don't know what's happening with primary health care. It doesn't look that good, and it doesn't look a whole lot different than the private sector, which is very big. But obviously, the public goods are necessary for government and Insurance markets have to be fixed somehow. Um, that catastrophic loss is a problem for absolutely everyone. Uh, even if you consider the middle class, they're really just one serious illness away from real hardship. Um, and everybody's afraid of falling into debt. Um, but the question is, is public insurance the solution? Could be. Um, rich countries certainly rely on it as their main uh, Actually, rich countries have uh, dozens of different ways of dealing with this problem. But a lot of them are, are insurance-based. Um, but insurance systems, which is an arm's length relationship between the funder and the provider, are, requires a lot of regulation uh, skills that are not that easy. Because what are you trying to do? You're trying to see what is a doctor doing in his own clinic and second-guessing him. That's really hard uh, uh, to do. And I think 
Um, I think we're going to be finding difficulties in some of our experiments with insurance. Sometimes it'll work a little bit for someone studying it very rigorously. Um, but in any case, this requires a great deal of auditing capacity, uh, monitoring capacity, regulatory, legal capacity. If you're going to sue a doctor, how long will you be in the courts? Um, and uh, there's lots of even technical issues on what do you pay them for and how do you know that they did what you told them to do. Uh, so if you pay them for doing stuff, they'll do too much. If you pay them by wages, they'll probably do too little. How do you find the right balance in between? Very, very difficult to do. I'm not going to do this. So uh, let me think about this, or let's think, please think about this, not me. Um, could it be that public hospitals, if they ran well, and they were credible competitors in the, in the minds of the public to private hospitals, is it possible that that would push some competitive pressure on private hospitals? Because everyone knows that they could go to the public hospital and get it at a reasonable price, possibly a very reasonable price. Um, I don't know. This is like a really hard question, and nobody is studying it. First of all, it's very hard to do. Very hard to figure out exactly what the pricing and quality conditions in hospitals are. Um, but it's, it seems to me that if people had these alternatives, just like they have in the primary healthcare uh, industry, the other way around, that public hospitals could have more than their fair share of influence, not just their own patients, but the influence on all of the other patients by uh, pulling down uh, fees in the private sector. We've been, I've been reading articles, they've been fair raising about how expensive private hospitals have become, and that people are very scared of uh, entering a hospital because uh, they have no idea what's going to be at the other end. And if they had a plausible alternative, maybe that would be fixed. That's a hypothesis, not a conclusion. Um, now, I realize that how, you're going to ask me, Jeff, so how do you fix public hospitals? Yeah, so I don't know. Um, but, but it seems like that might be something that we should be working on. I visited several hospitals around the country. I went to a district hospital in Putna. I'm not a doctor, but I'm pretty sure that having the surgery uh, recovery ward open to the outside with flies flying in and out is probably not a good idea. Um, uh, in any case, could we concentrate a little bit more on fixing the public hospital system? And one of the things that I blame is the board commission report, perhaps, and certainly the WHO, because of the fixation on primary health care centers that we've had for the last. 40 years. So you're, I've said this six times, but I'm doing it again. Public goods, hospitals, I'm not so sure about primary health care. Thank you. Friends, I promised you that Professor Hammer would be wasting and stimulating. But let me use a couple of more verses. Three words at you. It's provocative. Is challenging. Many of our settled assumptions in this country is challenged based on evidence. It's very difficult to stomach unless we go deep into it. And it's a very scathing indictment of the primary health care delivery system in the country. I wish Dr. Prashant Mahapatra, our friend, was here because he's been arguing for a long time that primary health care centers have lost all credibility in the country. We have to look at an alternative model. I don't think that Jeff is saying that primary health per se is not necessary. I want to, I know there will be a lot of angry people, uh, there will be a lot of concerned people. I don't think it's his argument that primary health or family health is not necessary. His argument is that it's not working the way we have conceived and executed in this country. Unless somehow we are bringing the market, we cannot fill the space between the public goods in terms of water supply, sanitation, immunization, etc. And the hospital care in between, certainly control of infections or treatment of infections. Non communicable diseases before they become catastrophic illnesses requiring serious hospital care, high cost care. 
family planning services in our country. And I think that's one area where we're doing reasonably well. We do require some, but that is not necessarily the public health care provider. Can we bring in the market with the provisioning of the resources from the public sector? That perhaps is one answer. Uh, Professor Land Pritchett on his way from the airport, before he joins us and then further stimulates us and provokes us and challenges us on education, school education. Uh, I request Sri Padana Vegaru to conduct a, a discussion on this very, very challenging thing. Uh, his tone is very soft, but his meaning is very menacing. <laughs> so, uh, I can assure you, this is about the most challenging presentation I can think of in terms of the public health system in the country. Uh, I hope they'll be very festive. Yeah. Sir? Well, there is nothing for me except to thank the professor and throw open the discussion. But I just wanted to mention a couple of things. The point he has made about the government's role in providing the basic health vitamins like the fresh water, clean air, and then sanitation and uh, nutrition, they are extremely important, there is no doubt at all. So I think that is uh, well taken. Uh, the second point he has mentioned is uh, about, uh, yeah, after saying that, two, three things have uh, disturbed me, uh, which I hope I understood his presentation. One is he has said, both in the public sector as well as in the private sector, the doctors at the primary level have spent about 39 minutes in a day with the patient. That's what he has said. If that is so, it's uh, really shocking. I, mean, I can understand the public sector is inefficient, but uh, why does it happen in the private sector also? The third one is he has said, giving an example of uh, unstable angina uh, discovery and all that, there's not much of difference between MBBS in the private sector, MBBS in the <laughs> private, private sector, public sector, and the non-MBBS. So these are some of the disturbing things. Now, uh, his emphasis has been on uh, some of these things cannot be done properly because of structural issues in the government by the public sector. So the private sector is the one. Unless there is something seriously wrong with them, you can't do this. All that is uh, said. To my mind, it's not uh, a question of public sector or private sector, but I think it's a question of uh, primary health care. Primary, uh, sorry, primary does not mean basic or inadequate or incomplete. Uh, primary means at the primary level, you examine the man properly. There should be a qualified doctor, a set of qualified doctors, uh, maybe one or maybe two, but then they should examine and find out some sort of screening is necessary. Otherwise, what happens is the corporate hospitals today are behaving like, are almost looking like the district level government hospitals, you know. So much of rush and everybody goes there straight, whether it is primary care, secondary care, tertiary care. Now, these tertiary quaternary care, these people are highly specialized, extremely costly equipment and all that. But should they take the burden of all the people, you know, right from the basic this one? Because we don't have a proper primary care center, whether it is a private or public one can look into that. Because most records show, and the World Bank also have advised the government of India over a long period. In fact, he himself has said for about 22 years he has been associated with the, uh, you know, India. So, if there are proper primary health care centers, we have screening is done. And then I, I read somewhere and I think it's correct. Almost 70% of the people don't have to go to the next level. If at the primary level itself, a proper screening is done. Another 20% may have to go to the secondary level. And it's only about 10% who are required the, the specialization and the sophistication that is required at the tertiary care. So I think we can't jettison the primary care that it needs to be done. A second point which needs to be taken into account is, of course, the quality of the doctors uh, is very important in either the quality and availability numbers. Because he has said they are not there and all that. Yes, they are not there for various reasons. Uh, so those things also are very important, you know, the, the quality of the doctors, the number of the doctors, the training we give to them and all that. So I just wanted to uh, mention this. And uh, 
Now we will throw it open uh, for discussion. So there are so many eminent uh, doctors here running, uh, as I mentioned to you, uh, Professor Hammer. Uh, there are people who run uh, some of the first class corporate hospitals here. Now another thing is talking about the corporate hospitals. I see, I know a lot of private doctors who run 20 bedded, 30 bedded, 100 bedded uh, hospitals. Uh, number of them say they have to close because nobody goes there. Everybody is running to the corporate hospital, you know. So, what do these people do at these uh, levels? So, and uh, primary care, where is it available? If he is an MBPS doctor, with the type of quality of the education we are giving, nobody wants to go to just an MBPS, you know, unless he has some other qualification at that level. So, these are some of the inherent problems. At one uh, stage, he asked, Am I saying that uh, dump the Indian uh, medical system, health system? I thought perhaps it will lead to that, you know. Perhaps it's not so. Uh, thank God. And we have mentioned what are the good things that have happened. You know, immunization program and the control of the, uh, you know, disease spectrum control and the infectious disease control. Some of the good things he has mentioned. So I would just throw it open and uh, please feel free to sort of push him. As he said, I think he was uh, challenging and provoked you. By, by purpose, you know, so that uh, I would elicit uh, better reaction from you. Thank you. So what I'm really arguing for is not that we take money away from primary health care and give it to the hospitals. I might argue that for the sanitation, but we won't go into that. Um, but as we're getting richer, I mean, the country's much richer. I've been here over, this, over these years. There's a lot more money. There will be for, uh, much greater allocations, depending on the government sometimes, but there will be more and more allocations to health. I guess I would argue not to take money away from primary health care centers, even if I'm dubious, but that the extra money spent should definitely try to rectify the imbalance and go more to the sewers and more to the 
functioning district hospitals and less extra money to the primary health care center. I'm not so naive as to think we're not going to have that again. Uh, I'd like to know, in summary, what is the remedial measure we have for the primary health care system? Is it insurance? Is it more hospitals? Or is it simply improve the, the sanitation facilities, better clean air, clean drinking water, and infrastructure? Thank you, sir. Yes. <laughs> yes, we should. Uh, we have not studied hospitals well enough. Um, I, suspect, I suspect we should get them to run better anyway, even if it didn't have all of these effects. I think it's important for the community. No, see, I, you got me on the spot here because there is just not enough data to figure out how these hospitals are doing. And so maybe step one is, why don't we figure out what these hospitals are doing? Uh, so that's one. I suspect it's a good idea to improve the hospitals no matter what. On um, primary care, I don't like to this problem, so I'm not going to push too hard on that. Um, but and uh, the other one is, yes, there are all of these traditional public goods, uh, tr public health interventions as understood in other countries that we are just so far behind. It's, it's really a, a, a tragedy. Um, the water, the sanitation, the pest control, the mosquitoes, the, it, the, the list goes on and on. And we just dropped all that and started spending on medical care. Well, it's very bitter to swallow what you have said. We are very accurate. I think one of the problems that we are failing to recognize is the bottom sub of our work. The memory can, cannot have the traction that can take care of the problems. So what you suggested is something that we have work on and develop. That is strengthen the secondary and tertiary care hospitals. The public make them responsible for a cluster of primary centers. Because in isolation, primary centers languish, and that's what they are. There is no integration of different levels of care, and that has led to this failure and dysfunctionality of our entire health care system in our country. The second is medical education is the standards are abysmally poor. And I don't see any light at the end of the tunnel. Unfortunate, but that's the truth. And the third thing is those who work in primary health centers. They have no role models to follow. We have to create some catalysts that can actually inspire the people working in primary health area to do better. And the third thing is the human resource HR policies. And both these are our members of allied health personnel again is far below what is required. The ideal would be at least 10 for every position. We don't even have one to one. And unless that problem is fixed, we can never solve the problem. So there's very, very fundamental problems which nobody is bothered to address. We're talking about infectious diseases today. I believe in five, 10 years when we have the convergence of the two big challenges of both Communicable and non communicable diseases, in which India is number one for everything. It's going to be a major healthcare crisis. And I, saw, I see no vision anywhere in Delhi to force out that disaster. And you thought I was pessimistic. <laughs>
Dr. Rao is one of our foremost uh, healthcare uh, professionals, institution in the field. Very proud of what has been here, world class institution. Uh, I'm not particularly surprised with the data that you presented. Um, I, would, I would like to see some of the methodology that you used uh, in the way that the, the, the numbers are arrived at. Um, but the point is that it is, it is I guess, oversimplification. Because uh, there are multiple problems, as you said, common policies, whether there's willingness to, if people like uh, Jay Prakash or Dr. Jay Prakash, uh, design something, whether there's willingness to implement it in part way, make sure that there's no critical will. And the, uh, the honesty, the uh, commitment that the doctors that are going out to these public um, centers to um, post it, there's absolutely none, as we showed very clearly. I'm surprised that about the private uh, um, doctors not spending enough time is a bit surprising because I come from a public a private hospital. I'd like to see the methodology that we use there. I believe that unstable. I'm a card surgeon, so I know a little bit of uh, uh, unstable angina. Uh, <laughs> I so I, um, I'm, I'm puzzled as to how an MBBS doctor uh, who's not even equipped to uh, diagnose. Um, can be compared with non-qualified uh, people, uh, you would expect that both would be the same. You know, both ignorant. So you can't, you can't really compare in that, in that particular uh, respect, not necessarily um, other areas. The other thing that puzzled me is that when we talk about primary care, what are we talking about? Are we, are we mixing preventive uh, aspects like sanitation, like protective water supply, um, better hygienic conditions, nutrition, and everything. Those are preventive aspects of uh, communicable diseases and other diseases. Or uh, primary care where you have colds, coughs, or maybe even sending people up for diagnosis of diabetes, hypertension, and other diseases, to maintenance of those diseases. So I believe. We may have to segregate what we're talking about so that there may be some meaningful conclusions that we can draw and perhaps design some systems where you know we can really make something out of it. Thank you. Uh, let me come back to the satellite, the PhD satellites of hospitals in a, in a second. Could well be a great idea. Um, just to clarify, you know, I didn't have enough time to explain every single research project uh, in detail. But on the unstable engine, it was, if it was very, very, it was very, very um, uh, forgiving. If uh, if you didn't have an, the appropriate machinery, a correct answer was get them to some place where they can get it as quickly as possible. But that, that counted as right. So even if you didn't know what to do, if you knew that they better get someplace quickly, that counted as fine. Also, giving an answer would be a good idea. Uh, that, that's all that. I don't know if that was all about, but that was one of the um, uh, solutions. Uh, by primary versus other facilities, I guess I should have been more uh, explicit. Uh, I think of the population-based um, interventions, quite a, which are all preventive, as quite a lot different from the patient-initiated um, interaction. So primary care for the purposes of these studies is whenever a patient approached a primary health care center. So it was all patient-driven. All of the big issues of, uh, public, of public health Water and sanitation, blah, blah, blah. Nutrition, there's a few that are in a gray area that are always to be discussed. Is an immunization program when a lot of outreach, primary care, or not? I don't care. I, mean, I, I would count that as the population based one. Um, uh, but I really have in mind when people get ill or feel like they are ill, 
they, they initiate the contact. That's what we would call a primary healthcare. That's that's all. Um, those are main ideas, I guess. Uh, so on the will in the final when things are working well, um, will there be hospitals as a hub with primary health care centers around it? There's a difference in approach for different kinds of people. I happen to be kind of an incrementalist, which is I don't really know what the final outcome is really going to look like. What I suspect is what you uh, proposed, which is the hospitals will start doing well. They're going to start getting a whole bunch of patients. They're going to realize, you know, a lot of these people really shouldn't have come to the hospital. They really could have done it uh, in a much cheaper value, which of course is the, the philosophy behind primary health care. But then it would be the hospital that would probably hire the nurses or whatever to be the um, to be the filter and try to make them as appealing and as uh, respected as possible. And then people might come to learn that it's okay to go to um, uh, those clinics that they know are carefully monitored and supervised by the hospital nearby. I don't know if that would happen. That's just, I suspect it would happen, but it sounded a lot like what, um, what, like what you were uh, proposing. Uh, one other thing on non-doctor providers, uh, the U.S. has exactly the same problem. Way, way too many, well, first of all, way too few doctors because of the American Medical Association, but even fewer nurses. Um, uh, that's a market problem, not really a medical uh, problem, and we could do a lot more with a lot less money uh, had we used more appropriate uh, personnel. But I believe that that's a problem almost everywhere. Uh, not just the US and uh, the so, yeah. so, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'd just like to get your thoughts on uh, the data. Uh, I'd like to draw your attention to a state, uh, Kerala, where the health indicators are typically uh, better than Delhi. So, Kerala is typically is about infant mortality is about 5. And the US is about 4.9, and Europe is about 4.3. In terms of sanitation and water supply, many of us may not know, Kerala is the worst. Kerala has, out of 74 towns in Kerala, not a single town, city, has sewer system. Not even Trivandrum, not even Cochin, live alone small and medium towns. There's absolutely no sewer system. Kerala is the only state that is no solid waste management system. This is the only state, including Hyderabad, has a fairly decent solid waste management system. Kerala has absolutely no solid waste management system. Kerala has significantly lower pipe water system than Bimaru states, as we call uh, Orissa, then UP, Jharkhand, Bihar, compared to pipe water systems. So I think it's a Kerala itself is a paradox, but from the data point of view, how do we explain this uh, relationship between substantially lower uh, sanitation and water supply system and uh, the data in terms of very high quality public health? Of course, the recent uh, information shows that it's not water and sanitation, it's beyond, it's immunization, and many other factors. So we work in water and sanitation, we need a lot of business for water and sanitation, but this data is very challenging as these days. If I may add to what Dr. Srinivasan mentioned, Kerala also has the highest rainfall. Kerala also has the lowest open defecation. And uh, Kerala also has maximum groundwater. So I suspect the answer is between both some of the facts you said. So, so I think that because uh, most of the pipe water comes from borewells, so you don't have this. And you don't need the public sewage system because they have localized uh, sewage pits. 
And uh, that could be the answer, I suspect. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, you should. <laughs> Actually, it's really strange to be in a question and answer session where Carol comes up as a bad example. <laughs> Usually it comes up as a good example and everyone says, oh, it happened to Carol, who cares, we can't do that. But it's interesting to hear it as a, a bad example. I have no idea. Uh, one more question could be the end of this event. Also, I know. One other paradox of our country is we have the most problems in the world and India also has the most solutions to the problems. But our problem is replicating and scaling them up. And the government sector just does not uh, follow the examples that are out there that have been demonstrated all over the country multiple times. Sir. Sir, sir, during your presentation, you were mentioned in some place that MBBS and non-MBBS doctors. Non-MBBS means can I know from which discipline they are practicing, what is their knowledge base? Okay. Another thing, some of uh, during discussions, some of the doctor he told them in Kerala, some the, the problems are little bit less. As per the observation, I think China is having some model. They are managing with traditional with modern medicine. And in Ayurveda, especially in Kerala, fortunately, they are adopting a lot of the norms related to traditional aspects. I think it may be a cause for getting problem less because communicable diseases, non communicable diseases. Nowadays, multi-facet medical systems are developing, personalized therapy. If there is any chance, you can propose something related to the management of the disease conditions. Thank you, sir. Why is it that the India is now being described as the diabetes capital of the uh, world, you know, and all that? Someone said it is the eating of rice, polished white rice, three times in the day, and it's all being encouraged by the government by giving the rice at one rupee a kilo. You know, so this is something very important. I mean, uh, our uh, legislator here, <laughs> Mr. Bishop, you should note this, you know. So earlier they used to eat other grain, you know the coarse grain and all that, but now three times a day, huge plateful of white, fine rice, this one, being supplied by the government, is the cause, you know. I think some of these things need uh, correction. see that as uh, kind of consistent with my point rather than a, 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 a strong counterpoint. Um, but Carol was interesting in a, in a variety of ways. Another reason why I'm, ten, I'm always reluctant to mention it is a long time ago, um, uh, Professor Marcia Sen um, uh, uh, and John Drez, I think, were writing together, said, you know, it's really remarkable that there are some places in the world 
with very good health indicators, but a very low income. And therefore, it's, it's really possible. And they were always the same examples. It was China, it was Cuba, uh, Sri Lanka, Costa Rica, and Carolina. And my, uh, I, think I, I was working on lots of data on different issues. And it turns out that what they must have been using was, uh, I not to be too technical, gross domestic state product, meaning production in the state. And by that measure, Kerala is very poor. Possibly because in every few years there'll be a communist government and, and big investors are a little bit scared of you know, what, what could happen in the world. But what they did do, that mentioned, uh, Sir mentioned education, so what? The doctors, teachers, all throughout the Middle East, all throughout the whole rest of the country, all throughout the world as far as I know. And what do they do? They send all of their money back. So if you were to measure, we can't do this because the RBI doesn't keep statistics this way. Uh, but if you were able to measure gross national state product, that doesn't make sense, uh, gross domestic state product plus remittances, they would they were never poor in the state. They all were able to, I mean, you drive down the street, it's like everybody has a mansion, right? It's, uh, it, it's, an, it's an amazing place um, in that respect. And I, I think they were always measured being poor when they were really not poor at all. So high incomes and high education. As I said before, the mother is the first line of defense against any disease. Uh, women know exactly what to do and they had enough money to do it. And they've been very good for lots of reasons. I didn't know anything about the ground. Dr. Bohr, Mohalla Trini. Hyderabad, we have got what are known as Basti Gavakas. We should study some of those things and see how they have been. Uh, Professor Rao has said about the education generally. But the nursing education, there are so many nurses there, they must be teaching you know, better the uh, methods of education. Anyone else, please? I have one more question. Over the years, we had such bad primary health care. Has it fundamentally changed our behavior? And we stop thinking that this has an option. Maybe if we revive that, it's like that, we have lost in our life. And the other aspect is I know that if I go to the school and have a power, if I go to the school and have a power, I know that I get the care. Is that why I am going to this?
really serve the, the patients, and I don't think, no, sorry, I don't want to draw a bunch, there's a large fraction of people who are completely dedicated, there's no question, of maybe 60%, maybe 70%, I don't know, it could be a lot of people who are very dedicated. But if you're going to expand the system, you're not necessarily going to get those people uh, more than other people because they're already decided. If you really feel like your mission in life is to help the people, you're going to be a doctor and you're going to be a good one. But if you need to increase, if you have to expand the system, you have to pull in more and more people. And it's not clear what kind of people you're pulling in. Um, uh, uh, through that uh, through, through that process. So one is the government is uh, doctors are going to have to change behavior somehow. Ethical norms are going to have to be much better developed, and patients are going to have to um, uh, change in some fundamental ways as well. They're going to have to accept that if a doctor says you mentioned seventy percent they can be cured, it's on seventy percent. Some number I heard, yeah. which could be made up, is that 60% is self. No, no, 70% you might be right. Yeah. 60 percent might be self-limited, uh, which means uh, if you go to the doctor, it will take a week to get better. If you don't, it will take seven days. Um, and um, uh, they're going to have to accept that if the doctor says there's not much I can do for you, then they'll say that's okay, and not insist on glucose drips and not insist on the antibiotics for everything, um, and so on and so forth. Now, how to teach the public to do anything, and how to change professional norms in general, that's, that's way over my weight. Good evening, sir. Recently, what Hyderabad city has come as the most livable city among all metro cities. The environment has given certain certain parameters they have taken. But the other side, many people are dying here because of the There's so much paradox is going on in this country. Beyond this, I think there is something more. I feel I don't know. We have a background, lack of communication, and the way people, any scheme you want, ultimately it is becoming a thing in the country. So that means there is something else than this. Why not we also think that what is the change India requires? Not only schemes, not only solutions. Solution in terms of man, human behavior at times. That is also very, very important. And uh, lack of awareness, campaign on the social issues. And without this, what are we are talking? Because uh, PHC fixation, sanitation, just now I told you how the sanitation happened in the hydrobatic itself. But despite all this, I am unable to understand Kerala, something they told, but the lifespan of the Kerala is the much, much higher than any other city in US today. Even in mortality rate and other rates also, if you take, definitely that is better, higher, higher aspect. So, I think some traditional inbuilt mechanisms are there in the Indian system. I think that is why we are surviving. Otherwise, we can't survive with the traditional public goods in this country. So, anyway, I think, think beyond this, I think there we must find a solution. I think that's my favorite. Uh, good evening, sir. Uh, sir, uh, as in your presentation, sir, uh, insurance played a very major part in uh, primary health care. In the survey conducted in 2018 by WHA, WHO, it was shown that 80% of the Indians are not covered in the health care policies. Uh, and sir, the main reason behind that was uh, most of the people were not able to understand the technicalities and the complexities in the mechanism of uh, health insurance policies. So do you think that uh, some simpler approaches like medical saving accounts where uh, saving accounts are open only in banks, uh, saving accounts are open only for this uh, medical facilities uh, are able to you know, cover, uh, will provide more, uh, will have a better reach than the insurance policies and uh, helping uh, achieving the, cover, the medical cover 
uh, which we are uh, searching through insurance. Uh, from a research study carried out on water safety 
uh, in the Nalgunda district on Flores' problem, pertaining to Flores' problem. So, the advocates were asking for data. You know, we need data uh, to, to understand which sources are actually uh, uh, actually the flooring flooring content. In which sources the flooring content is in major quantity? Okay, they were asking. So we have done a survey and we have got the data and uh, we have done sort of analysis and all. But then uh, there there was uh, a primary issue. You know. Uh, uh, in terms of surface water, you know, the government was not able to provide surface water to them, you know, to the people of uh, the district. You know, and we were doing surveys, you know, we were doing uh, sort of analysis, we were doing sort of research and all, but to understand the problem. Uh, my, my question is, uh, uh, we are looking at primary health care centers and all, uh, but are we actually providing uh, Basic amenities like drinking water, evenly to, to the district people. Uh, you haven't cleared this, sir. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that was a major point I wanted to get across is that the drinking water stuff is first order priority and more. Is it, is it evenly, evenly provided to all the people? You know, we are talking about primary healthcare centers. Uh, which are secondary again, you know. But the basic problem will comes with water, water, water itself. But the, if, if water is not provided, then yeah. Well, so, yes. Universal health care to be achieved by 25 or 30, 2030. And there are so many things which are yet to be done in that. They are all aspirational, you know. So many institutions to be created, so many systems to be created. So have a look at it, you know. So it's not all that simple, you know. Uh, oh, I would like to hesitantly challenge Dr. Sahama on a couple of issues. One, take NHS, the family care model. I'm not up to the rest of the things. They brought in market beautifully in a country which is entirely public sector driven healthcare system. Dr. Gopich and others, they actually were trained in the UK, whereby you choose uh, a service provider of your choice. And they get either fee for services or a per capita. Therefore, there's an incentive to retain the patients. And there are certain standards. So perhaps there is a case to bring market into this family care between the public goods provisioning that you are arguing and the catastrophic health care required in hospitals, one problem. The second big point, uh, in at least some parts of the country, I was very pleasantly surprised last year when I went intensive to several hospitals at various levels. Despite all the handicaps and low funding and other problems, there is actually some improvement. I went there with the expectation that things would be disastrous. Maybe the bar is not very low. Uh, but what consistently on notice is, at certain levels, I'm not saying at every level, if you take the public money spent, we talked about per rupee, what is the outcome? And if you compare the total services that are delivered there and do a costing, at the low end of the spectrum in terms of the costing, Every rupee is giving us typically four rupees out. So all is not lost if the design is proper. I know you. So on the first point, I think uh, that, that sometimes, so that sometimes, that's happened a lot like an insurance scheme. <laughs> right? The government is paying a private provider to do stuff. Um, uh, I anticipate that there could be problems when it's uh, that out, you know, uh, but there are always uh, examples of yeah, some some administrator for that scheme happens to be extremely talented at uh, ferreting out of fraud and making sure that they're not being uh, uh, overcharged and stuff like that. Um, and I don't doubt that there might be many such things. The thing is, is it is it dependent on the skill of that person? 
If it's dependent on the skill of that person and not an institutional feature, then we're, then we're back to the scaling issue. And you could give me lots and lots of examples of things do in fact work. And if they work for systematic reasons, then I will back off completely and say, great, well, let's do that. But if it's successful because there was a charismatic leader, not so sure. Uh, uh, no, 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 we're talking about a local adventure. But you have to say second point. Your second point? Oh, there has been a proposal. Okay. I, have, I hate to advertise, but I have this big other study that's uh, showing, uh, uh, it's a photographic survey of, of India. It uh, shows what is their, <laughs> no, no, I'm sorry, but it's related to this. There's no question the government, is, I mean, sorry, the country is getting much richer. Uh, and getting much richer, I don't know, people, I think people underestimate what that means. Uh, it means, you go out and you can buy stuff and you can guarantee that the thing you buy is better because you have alternatives to stuff. You can also be more influential in your local, not too much local uh, discussion on this, but you can be more powerful even on political things and make sure that some of the government procedures work better because you can say, you can walk away um, because you have money. And so I think money come, has helped a lot of things, and I would like to be able to trace through precisely what led to the improvements. I've seen fabulous improvements across the country over the years as I've been uh, uh, studying this. The question is, is it a result of deliberate policy, or is it just you got rich? Yeah, okay. Good evening, uh, Professor Hammer and uh, the dignitary is on the dais and off the dais. First of all, I am not a doctor, I am a mechanical engineer from Kolkata. I have come to uh, attend one training program at ASCII. And I am uh, fortunate enough to find you and to be in this uh, program. Uh, first of all, from your representation, one issue was that open application. But I would uh, like to add here that it has uh, coming down, it has been uh, coming down uh, after implementation of this uh, proper toilet, in, uh, especially in this uh, rural and interior areas. And uh, second thing is that I have some question regarding this air quality index, the deterioration in the northern India, especially in Delhi and other surrounding states. Uh, the reason being uh, burning of the stars and all what we uh, used to see in the newspapers and other uh, news agencies. But what is the problem, sir? Neither we can stop stable burning after uh, cultivation and uh, neither we have any control over the air through the direction and all. But it is highly detrimental for uh, public health. Can you just trust this team? Uh, is there any way out to uh, or any protection of the uh, public health so far as this is concerned? Okay, there, there's the two. There's one sanitation and there's one air pollution. Um, So I had been working on the total sanitation campaign, which came in between the Central Rural Sanitation Program of 1986 uh, and the Swatch Fire. And the problem with the social, I'm sorry, the Central Rural Sanitation Program of 1986 is that they built toilets all over the place. And then when I went back to do some of the field work in studying the total sanitation campaign, I was shown around to the uh, toilets that were built under that scheme. I think the contracts were written very badly because a lot of them were very nice superstructures over a solid slab that had no hole in it. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm thinking of the poor villagers who were saying, I wonder what they think we're going to use this for. And in the state of Maharashtra, the state said that more than half of them were being used uh, as sheds for um, uh, keeping fertilizer and pesticides out of the rain. There were a few in the very poor areas of the environment, uh, and, uh, 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 
in, in Maharashtra, where far and away, this was the nicest building in the entire village. All the rest of the village was mud and model, dirt floors, and so on and so forth. These were all built to steps with a concrete floor, and, uh, concrete the walls. And uh, more than once, so it's, it's an anecdote, but it's more than once. Um, they decided since this is by far the nicest building in the village, it should be a puja room because it should be dedicated to the gods. They should have the best. So, one, sorry, the way it's related to this is the government reports a lot of things about um, how well the Swatch Bar mission is doing. Um, forgive me if I'm a little um, skeptical. Uh, because a lot of the times it's the same thing. They're building toilets and they're counting, they're assuming that people are using them properly. Admittedly, they're much better built than the previous one, but I don't think that you can so uh, mechanically uh, multiply the number of toilets by some fraction, by some people, and say that's how many people are now open defecation free. I think it's much uh, more difficult than that. Just a little bit of skepticism. I think everybody should be skeptical of all numbers that come out of government statistical offices uh, and, and think, you know, are we really being told? Do, how do they know, actually, is the question. Not that they're lying, but just how could they possibly know this? Um, air pollution, that's also way over my head. There's, uh, there's construction dust. There's the fact that the entire valley, I mean, the whole region is dusty all by itself. Uh, there's the burning of stubble. The, the burning of stubble might be fixable because there are low-till, but there are other ways of doing it. Or in any case, uh, as an economist, we would say you should tax pollution. So maybe you should tax uh, uh, farmers who are burning their uh, crops. And if they do find some other way of changing from the other way around again, um, uh, then they don't have to pay this uh, tax. That one, I think, is uh, addressable. However, it's the government of Delhi has no authority whatsoever in Punjab. <laughs> so, yeah, for that one, there might be a, a technical fix of some sort, but the, the relevant uh, political unit <laughs> isn't uh, has no jurisdiction. It's a really hard problem. But seriously, do you really think we're going to have to have this uh, uh, Delhi's? Cities be that bad forever. China has changed. Mexico has changed. I don't know what they did, but they did something. <laughs> Last intervention because Professor Bridget is just about to enter my next time, so. Hardly anybody looks at outcomes, and even less so about impact. And the same is the situation of the developing world. His question is how come we had him talking, not you? <laughs> that different rich governments have come up with all kinds of different ways to deal with a very difficult problem. And to, France is entirely different from Germany, it's entirely different from Denmark, it's entirely different from Canada. So everybody's struggling to come up with a way to fix it. The problem is universal, I mean, private markets won't work. The solutions uh, go all over the place. And if it wasn't for the US, uh, they would be complaining about the system. As far as the measuring outcomes is concerned, that was basically my argument about the National Rural Health Mission, is that we have no idea what, what, what infant mortality, what child mortality or illnesses 
outcome were in the first place, and we didn't know what they were afterwards either. Uh, and that was uh, something we really should have been funded. If maternal mortality is so important, how come we only know it accurately once every 10 years? Good evening, sir. Uh, last year, I was uh, I was in a place called Sipilingi in Tamil Nadu, and I spent some days in a tribal health initiative with Dr. Nolan, uh, Dr. Reddy, and Lalita. And uh, I was while doing the initiative, and I was trying to understand the governance of health through hospitals and how it works in a tribal area. And we asked him the question, uh, sir, how, what do you need to cure all these people? In a fun way and in a very funny way, he answered, I need food engineers. And we were a little surprised. And when I asked him, uh, I didn't understand what he wants to say. He said, I want good roads. And uh, what he said was, later on we inquired him and said was, from the time the patient realized that there is some problem, to the time he or she reaches the doctor's desk, can you reduce that time? in a governance model. So my question is, is there any data which shows this um, and at a, at a larger level? One, the second question we asked is, are there a lot of primary health initiatives around the tribal initiative? And uh, most of the tribal people were attending this, um, this, this uh, hospital rather going to the nearby private, private, uh, uh, primary uh, initiatives. So we I inquired, we asked them, few of them, why do they come here? Why do they not uh, attend uh, or go to the hospital nearby their village? They answered, the doctor always, whenever they see the patient, he smiles. It's a, it's a very, the doctor smiles at the patient and the patient feels good. So later on we realized um, every staff member of the hospital and each and every member of the hospital treats the patient with dignity. So is there any data which talks about how does the patient feels when they enter the initiative and how does this impact the larger model of governance? Thank you, sir. There are a lot of studies. What's great by you are very well aware. You know the golden number and all those things they say about the patient about the communications are very important. And doctor-patient relationship, counseling, all these things are very important. And why all those uh, problems have come up last year, you know, doctors being beaten up in some places and all that, unfortunately, because of lack of proper communication and speaking. Friends, sir, I think we will conclude this yeah, part. Right. Professor Prince is about to arrive. <coughs> this is a fascinating discussion. My appeal is, I know it's a very heavy dose. But kindly bear with me, Professor Bridget will be in a minute of time here. And it will be as challenging and as provocative as uh, Professor Hamani is. I think we need to be provoked. The ship leads and the perfunctory response, yes. And doing more of the same simply does not help. Uh, so, what I request is to save time before it's for us over the past 15 minutes. They say in two minutes, I think somebody lost the way. I don't know. My apologies for that. Uh, I think you start off uh, by way of introducing both uh, uh, Mr. Mamadi Bojiti and Lan Richard and then he join us. Meanwhile, the presentation is on the computer. Two minutes have been given for 15 minutes, so go on, please. <laughs> uh, we'll make the speaker's presentation very brief, 20 minutes or so, as a punishment for delayed arrival, and then have an interaction. Well, then, then the people will cut it off, that's the problem. <laughs> Hello everyone. It gives me an immense pleasure to talk about uh, Mr. Bojwari's accomplishments and to remember him today this night. Uh, Mr. Mamadi Bojwari was born uh, in Hyderabad to an agricultural family. He graduated from Ismania University with a law degree. He participated in the Hyderabad Liberation Movement and he served as district panchayat president, Nagaland district, from 1962 
to 76. He was a legendary and was known for his integrity and commitment for local governance. He quit politics soon after the imposition of emergency. Sri Bojredi Garu was a passionate supporter of public library movement and was chairman of Hyderabad Grandalaya Samastha and an office bearer of Andhra Pradesh Granthalaya Samastha for several decades. He played a key role in the establishment of hundreds of public libraries throughout Haiti. Sri Bojredi Garu was also actively associated with the cooperative movement. He headed Hyderabad District Cooperative Bank the AP Cooperative Banks Association and AP State Cooperative Union for 10 years. Sri Bojredi was a firm believer in the government, in the empowerment of women and girls through education. He was a co-founder of Sangam Lakshmi Bai Vidya Peet and Education Society, exclusively devoted to education of girls. It runs five institutions, a high school, a junior college, degree college, engineering college and pharmacy with enrollment of 4,300 girls. So it's, uh, let's take this moment to, uh, to uh, uh, celebrate this Thank you. So land will be here in a minute. Uh, hopefully. And, <laughs> and let's uh, take some time to, uh, to talk about who he is and what he did uh, in the last many years. Lamb was born in Utah and he was raised in, raised in Idaho and uh, graduated from BYU in 1983 with a major in economics. He was a PhD from Harvard in 1998, following which he served the World Bank uh, from 1988 to 2007. During this period, he lived in Indonesia from 98 to 2000, lived in India from 2004 to 2007. He taught at Harvard Kennedy School between this period, 2000 to 2004, and after the after serving the World Bank, he also went back to teach there from 2007 to 2018. He is known for authoring many books. One of the book um, titled uh, "Schooling Ain't Learning" is a very good book, good book for for you if you're interested. He authored six books. He was part of uh, two World Development Reports. He uh, had hundreds of journal articles, book chapters, and working papers on his name. He co-authored them with 50 other writers. And uh, he has uh, spoke about, written about, and worked for a range of development issues. And those are economic growth, education, labor mobility, state capability, health, development assistance, social capital, population, international trade, safety net programs, and methods of project evaluation. So a lot to say uh, about land uh, in this context. And he's been married for, uh, to Mrs. Uh, Diane Pritchett and has three children and two grandchildren. Uh, so we were actually uh, looking at his profile and saying that he didn't climb Mount Everest, he didn't learn how to play a cello, and he's not writing poetry, except that probably he, does, he did everything and it should be taken by surprise if he actually picks up some of those and starts doing that. And that has been his accomplishments and we look forward to inviting him here. And then very soon he'll be here and we'll hear from him more on the education. Thank you. Uh, before land arrives, shall we have some reflections on this subject? Sanjay, the former school education commissioner of AP, currently chief PMG. Uh, yeah. She's here in many eminent educators, administrators are here. Uh, we will spend time now. The discussion that follows the speech or uh, lecture, we can perhaps have a bit of it before that. Yeah. So, who will initiate? Basically, his theme is outcomes are terrible. A focus on enrollment now is okay, but it really needs an event in terms of outcomes. I think broadly we all understand. Uh, that's the context in which we have to examine. Yeah, you asked the lady to speak. We can start. I mean, what do you think of the outcomes, you know, in the education in the last uh, decade or so? Your own uh, experiences.
Professor Pritchett. Welcome to you and directly you're in the talk. So let me go very quickly, um, because the main point I want to make is that the, uh, the most difficult thing to do is what, in fact, India now needs to do to fix several key sectors, which is to change from a successful approach. Because the approach that has been successful at one thing is going to continue to be unsuccessful at the new thing. And so all of the habits and practices and ways in which one worked to do one kind of thing are not going to work to do the new kind of thing. And yet the hardest thing for any organization or culture or anything to do is to change. And it's especially hard when you're changing from success. If you've always failed, it's easy to change. But when you've been successful. So the first point is, oh, is it, I just blanked it, is, so the main storyline is, um, there's been an amazing, impressive, historically transformation success in the schooling sector in India, whereas 50 years ago or 60 years ago, only 2 or 3% of children went to school. Now it's exactly the opposite. Only 2, two to 3% never go to school. So just a truly amazing success at getting every child in Indian school. But the learning outcomes of those children who are in school are shockingly dismal. Um, and I have five or different sources from evidence because many people I talk to, like this audience, who are very intelligent and very capable, have a hard time believing how awful the education system is, is in India because you're all so smart, it can't be that bad. It is that bad in spite of the fact that you are so smart. So I'm not doubting your capability, but the impressive thing about your capability is that it survived the Indian education system. <laughs> uh, um, so, uh, and therefore, reentering, reorienting an organization from one kind of success in which all that had to be done was essentially characterized as logistics to another kind of success, which is quality improvement, is the hardest thing to do, but it needs to be done. And so, um, so there's success and expansion. Um, learning inside Indian schools is very bad. I have, and we can all circulate later, the PowerPoint if you want to see the pieces of evidence, but I have many pieces of evidence. Um, this is how many women are literate by years of schooling. India is about the Bangladesh, about 40 percentage points behind Indonesia, which is a middle-income country that India doesn't think is like wildly ahead of it. Um, again, a completely different data set, same kind of literacy. Only about half of uh, adult women can read like a simple passage. Um, the World Bank, these are the people who neighbor um, India on the World Bank's assessment of learning. And if you look, India, this is not a neighborhood India wants to be in. It's barely above Congo and Afghanistan. It's behind Zambia, or it's uh, 
yeah, it's barely above the Congo and Afghanistan, below Ethiopia and Iraq. Again, not where India thinks of itself, not where it should think of itself, not where it wants to be. Um, even though India, Indians both here and abroad win Nobel Prizes and Booker Prizes for Literature and the educated Indian elite is the envy of the entire world in many ways. There's just not that many really in the elite. Less than 1% of students in Tamil Nadu and Himachal Pradesh when assessed by PISA, less than 1% were at levels 4, 5, or 6. That 30% of kids in the UK and 40% so again, it's not that you're a little bit behind Korea, it's night and day. It's less than 1% versus it being routine. Um, and I just want to focus a bit on this slide, which I call the Great Betrayal, which uh, comes from, and I am deliberately not showing you a bunch of Oscar statistics because I know those get overused and people start to think they can't be right, which is why I show you four of the things showing they are right. But they did a study of 14 to 18 year olds and they asked a question, this little girl goes to sleep at 9.30, she wakes up at 6.30. How many hours did she sleep? This isn't even arithmetic. You can count this up on the fingers of your hand. That's how I'd solve it. I wouldn't write down the equation. I'd say, check for 11.30, okay? So children without school almost never got right, 26%. But of kids with eight or more years of schooling who had sat through Day in, day out, year after year, less than half could answer that question correctly. And, here's a shocking bit, all the children that were enrolled as undergraduates in a tertiary degree, only slightly more than half could say how many hours. So, just radically, radically unprepared for the 21st century. You know, everybody's now talking about 21st century scale. This is a 19th century scale. Okay, so um, <clears throat> there's four things that you're going that the group, I assume many of you are or are trained to be IAS officers, right? <laughs> the natural instincts of the way in which you're inculcated are going to be exactly wrong. You're going to do exactly the wrong thing, and you're going to do it with the best of intentions, and it's not going to work. So I just want to warn you, you're going to waste the next 10 years trying to solve a non-logistical problem in the logistical ways that have brought the previous success. So, one thing we'll say, well, let's just wait and see. We're growing really fast. We're having success in lots of other things. Certainly, that general prosperity will translate back into success in education. It won't. Or, if it does, it'll take you about 150 years to reach OECD levels. But typical business, is, the optimistic business as usual path is one point a year on a scale of 500, on a scale in which India is 150 points behind. That means it won't be your children that catch up. It won't be your grandchildren that catch up. It won't be your great grandchildren that catch up. It won't be your great great grandchildren that catch up. You'll have to go six generations to catch up if you follow the business as usual pace. Business as usual can't be an option. You might want to do more schooling. Well, gee, we were good at getting kids in school. Let's just keep them in school longer. The problem with that is that most kids that are dropping out of school are dropping out of school because they're not learning anything. They have fallen so far behind the curriculum that they're not learning anything because the curriculum, it would be like me starting to speak in Spanish. If I were giving this lecture in Spanish, you wouldn't get anything out of it because it's just not communicating. Most kids that are dropping out of school are dropping out of school in part because the curriculum is so far outstripped where they are that they're just not learning anything. Pushing those kids back into school or keeping them longer at the business as usual way of teaching won't help. Uh, and I, I can, all of these points I'm making in very schematic form. I can give you long, detailed, complicated, evidence-based reasons for this. Third, more of the same, which is, okay, yeah, we know the schools are low quality, but we can improve the buildings, and we can build a girls' toilet, and we can have the textbooks, more textbooks, and the textbooks are right on time, and we can lower class size, and we can provide more imports. Not going to work. You've already done it. 
SSA tripled for student spending, expanded infrastructure, delivered the goods, and while that happened, just a random state that I looked at, Tamil Nadu, <laughs> public sector being supported by SSA, lost um, 1.2 million students. So during this whole time, the public sector was being strengthened, 1.2 million less students, absolute numbers, were in the public schools. And there was no evidence that the scores improved or anything else about them improved. So the, the latest, most fashionable thing is top down, let's get a dashboard, let's get big data, let's get AI or some AI, let's, you know, let's get consultants, let's drive this thing to success by dictating hard, you know, harder, faster, deeper, let's get it done this way. You can't build a quality education system this way. It's just not gonna work because that's the way you do logistics. But I'm happy to speak my thoughts. Okay, so, okay, so now I've taken 10 minutes so I, I hope, if this is very schematic, had I had four of you, I would have taken longer. I would have been nicer. You might have liked me at the end, but. <laughs> I should have started with some nice thing. But anyway, okay, no time. Okay, so first, huge success. Huge success was at logistics, right? Um, that huge success at logistics is a success, it's wonderful. No one doubts it. It was terrific. It had to happen. But that's going to lead you into trying to continue to do logistics when it's no longer really a logistical problem. It's really a problem that really is about human beings. And man, I hate problems that involve human beings. Because they're the, you know, any problem with data is ten times as easy as any problem with a human being. So, um, here are the, so, and again, I have terrific, terrific evidence for everything I've just said. Just slides that have, um, so, so, now, I can tell you how to build a quality education system, but you're not going to listen to me. Because you're going to be listening to consultants from BCG and McKenzie and whatnot and so forth and TCS. All of them are going to want to push you to do better, faster, slicker, more IT-enabled logistics. Better, faster, slicker IT logistics is not going to work. So let me tell you three things. So I'm not, I'm not going to tell you how to do it. Because I could, but it wouldn't work because you don't yet believe that you need something different. So I'm going to talk about three things about what could be truly different. Um, so first, you have to acknowledge that changing an organization that's been successful is super hard, right? So I'm giving you examples. The US military <laughs> in the 1950s, 60s was an incredibly effective organization. It was incredibly well prepared to fight a tank war in Eastern Europe. <laughs> Unfortunately, it got involved in a jungle war with an insurgency in Vietnam, and they got their ass kicked. They got their ass kicked because they couldn't learn. They knew, they were the best, they were the top, they knew how to fight a war, and they were gonna fight a war like they'd been trained to fight a war, and the best army in the world got its ass kicked, and the United States of America withdrew in complete shame in an army after having suffered a terrible defeat. Why? Because a successful organization can't learn. Um, Sears was the behemoth of retailing in the world went bankrupt. Why? Because a successful organization can't learn. Um, IBM lost half of its employees in four years after having been so big and so successful that the US government concluded it was a monopoly that had to be broken up because nobody could ever challenge IBM. Guess what? IBM lost half of its employees, almost went bankrupt because successful organizations can't learn. Um, so, I want to just get three big concepts out on the table and then we will go to Q&A and hopefully we can elaborate these more. The first is, the challenge facing India 
is bringing organizations back from the brink. It is not administering or managing existing success. And bringing an organization back from the brink is a qualitatively completely different phenomenon than managing an ongoing success. Second, there is enormous damage done by great policies. <laughs> Good policies make for bad outcomes. Um, and I'm going to explain why. And third, I'm going to talk about disruption and why disruption, which is a very popular word, why disruption is very hard in the public sector. So, first, a functional organization <clears throat> exists by having three things. <laughs> Every really truly functional organization has a clear and coherent purpose. It knows what it's about. It knows what it does, and it can answer it in a single sentence that your grandfather or grandmother can understand. If you say, what do we do? We make shoes, right? The motto of the United States Air Force is, fly, is fly, fight, win. What does the US Air Force do? Fly, fight, win. Purpose. Second, the organization has to believe in a USB. The organization has to say, we as an organization have a unique and valuable way of contributing to this purpose, and we believe in it. The Catholic Church has a purpose. Its purpose is to get people to heaven. What's unique about the Catholic Church? They believe they're the true church. If they stop believing they're the true church, they stop being an effective organization, because that's their USB, right? Third, each individual in that organization needs to understand what contribution they make to the USB and to the purpose. If you don't have that at the center of the core of the organization, this is the core of the organization. And all of these other things exist to support them. HR exists as a service to group into the organization people that acquire the purpose, the USP, and the commitment. Legal exists to make sure you don't violate the law. Procurement buys the organization the goods it needs to fulfill its purpose, carry out its USP, get people committed. Accounting, all of those are service functions. They don't drive the organization, they support the organization. What happens when organizations die is that you lose the core. The individuals in the organization no longer believe in the USP or the purpose of the organization. The organization's management no longer believes that it has something unique and valuable that it can convey to its employees. And the organization as a whole stops believing it has a purpose. In which case, what happens is it becomes a compliance zombie. All it does is the service functions eat the organization alive. They cannibalize the organization so that all the organization about is following the rules. If your organization can't break the rules, it's not an effective organization. I know that sounds paradoxical, and I know that sounds odd in a country that struggles with rule compliance and corruption, but if you can't say, I know what HR says, but we're hiring this person anyway because they will contribute to our organization because it will fulfill our purpose and win against HR, you're not an effective organization. If you, if you can't say, um, I know what the procurement rules are and I'm going to skirt them in the following way in order to accomplish the purpose and win against procurement, you're not in an effective organization. You're in a compliance-driven zombie. So the first thing is about a compliance-driven zombie is you have to restore the core. You have to start from the core. You've got to re- you've got to, you've got to re- uh, you've got to rebuild the commitment to purpose. You've got to rebuild the belief in and across the organization in that the organization brings something unique and valuable to that purpose. And you've got to bring to the individuals participating that they are themselves making an individual contribution to the purpose and to the USP. You have to rebuild an organization from the brink, starting from the core. <laughs> right? You can't rebuild it from its service functions driven. We have a saying for this, you can't beat a turtle to move. Dysfunctional organizations become turtles protected by the shell of compliance. 
I mean, how many organizations do you know in India that aren't doing anything? They have lost any real rationale for existence, but they comply with HR policies and hire people. They get budget and they give budget statements back. They do accounting. They do procurement according to the rules. The compliance is a shell that protects them from external attack. If they're in compliance, that they don't have a purpose, well, that's secondary. And the only way to rebuild this organization is not by attacking from the outside, but rebuilding them from the inside. Rebuilding them from uh, regaining the purpose. They know what they're doing. They, have a, they believe in what they're doing is contributing, and they're right. <laughs> and they rebuild the sense of the individual contributing in a normative sense. I am doing this because it's important for me to do this, because this is how I am a good and normatively complying person with reality. Okay. First, that back from the brink, to bring things back from the brink, and I say this because I don't know if you recognize what I'm attacking, but all of the dashboard stuff is trying to rebuild the car through its dashboard. Like if the engine's broken, you can't fix it by fixing the dashboard. <laughs> right? If your transmission is on the ground, Having a dashboard tell you exactly that you're going zero miles an hour, time after time after time, because you're not going, because you don't have the transmission. You gotta fix the transmission. The guts of an organization, a purpose, USP, and people, until you fix that, the dashboard is just gonna drive people to distraction, and they'll look at the dashboard and I don't know, do all kinds of crazy things of these buns sitting around in offices in the capital to do, but it won't, in fact, bring an organization that's on the verge of dysfunction back to being functionally effective. Okay, <laughs> second point is um, imagine, and this is gonna remind you of when you took chemistry or engineering or something before you took the IAS exam and passed it, congratulations, it's impressive. Um, but there's kind of a dynamics. If we see that countries have good policies and good practices and that practices roughly comply with policies, we might assume that therefore we can drive good practices that produce success by jumping immediately to terrific policies. What could make more sense if Finland has terrific schools and our schools aren't so good, let's just adopt Finland's policies. Like, what could be more common sense than not reinventing the wheel? Let's just adopt best practice. If you're in a world where the dynamics are such that good policies actually put pressure on practices, Where's somebody who's supposed to have a rubber band for me? Okay. Then that all works really, really well. And that in fact works, right? But life is not always like that. There's something that we call rubber band or narrow corridor dynamics in which the policy and the practices have to stay close together. If the policy gets too far from the practice, you make it impossible for the individuals to actually have practices that lead to success. And it looks like we went out and bought some rubber bands so that everybody can have one later. <laughs> and when they said, what did this professor from Oxford talk about? He said, he talked about rubber bands. So you can imagine that if I want my left hand to move, I hook it to my right hand. This is policy, this is practice. And what I do is I make the policy better than the practice and I try and build capability to build improved practices, right? That works unless you adopt best practice, in which case you adopt the mic right? The problem is, is the rubber band, the dynamics of a rubber band have a nonlinear dimension to them. It gets more and more pressure and then suddenly it stops being pressure at all because the rubber band snaps. India is full of snap rubber bands. <laughs> It's full of policies that on paper are terrific. You're happy to brag about them everywhere around the world, <laughs> combined with practice that has nothing to do on the ground with the policies. Right? I mean, I hope I'm... I, <laughs> anyway. So, in some sense, there's a narrow corridor. You can't, in fact, completely improve practices with policies. In fact, maybe the real dynamics is to work on practices. Let's find out what are the practices that we can do in our, with our given capability that promote our purpose, 
and then adopt those as policy. So good practices become enshrined as policy, rather than imagining we can drive policies from the top, we can drive good practices from good policies. I'm sure my friend Jeff Hammer has mentioned some things about the health sector and how you have a whole bunch of doctors all over the country that have a quite good medical training, but they're quite good medical training and the quite good prescriptive practices for diagnosis and treatment that accompany each level of healthcare unit have nothing to do with what happens when a patient shows up at the door. You've said this, right? Something like that. Okay, so, so the second thing is, and it, and it makes it worse, because what it does is it drives the actual practices underground, right? If we've said, this is a policy, no one can be honestly in violation of the policy. So you force everyone to be dishonest, you force the reports you get to be false, in order to achieve paper compliance, and you lose control of practices. You gain control of reports and lose control of reality. Okay. Yeah. I hope a few people in the room can. I've seen that sometimes. Okay. Okay. Then let me talk one more concept, even though I'm getting 25 minutes, in spite of the fact I'm speaking as fast as I can. Um, and that's the concept of disruption. Um, the concept of disruption is really a concept that sometimes worse is better. That sometimes, this is a theory built out by a business professor who says, look, when an incumbent is in a market where what most people, is, what most people need is better than the technological frontier, the firm that can get to the frontier and advance the frontier the fastest wins. But sooner or later you get to a point where actually what's needed isn't really the frontier anymore. A whole bunch of people could actually use something that's not at the frontier, but better than what they're getting. Then, what happens? These people on the technological frontier don't care. Right? This is exactly, I mean, this whole thing is built to describe what happened to IBM. When the IBM's personal computer came out, guess how many IBM engineers wanted to work on it. None. It was silly. It was stupid. The IBM 370 was like the machine that was going to change the world. It was the cutting edge of engineering technology. A PC was some stupid thing for kids in garages. So the disruptive technology was in fact worse. It really wasn't the IBM 370. It really was terrible. But it put, it, it put the whole technology on a different trajectory to where on the disruptive trajectory, what was on the disruptive trajectory became good enough and got better enough because it was under pressure to get better, and the existing technology died entirely. So all of five of the 10 best managed IT firms in the world went bankrupt. Not because they got stupid, not because they forgot how to manage, but because they paid attention exclusively to this and ignored disruption. Now, the difficulty with the public sector in disruption is that here's the world's frontier. Um, everyone likes to imagine that where they are is this yellow line. They admit they're behind the frontier. Um, but they imagine that they can implement reforms that will get them to the frontier in short order with roughly the tools and in ways that people at the frontier are doing it. So what they want to do is mimic the frontier, and hopefully the mimicking the frontier will get them to the performance frontier. As opposed to looking and saying, we're not at the frontier. We aren't a country of four million white kids, Finland, all of whom come from very advanced backgrounds, Finland, all of whom are well prepared in their homes and school ready, Finland. We're not Finland, we're India, and we should be looking to be a disruptive India, and pretending that you're going to compete with India, to compete with Finland head to head by adopting India's, by adopting Finland's policies and making them India's practices is a pipe dream that leads the reality to be on the red line. <laughs> yeah. But if you try and do anything in the blue line in disruptive space, everybody tells you that's not best practice. 
That's not what we should be doing. We should be emulating the good guys. Why are we doing something that isn't at the cutting edge? We should be at the cutting edge. If you stay at the cutting edge, you commit suicide. You cut yourself to death and never get there. You have to be disruptive, which means you have to admit where you really are. And if we go back to where I said where we are in education, we're really, really, really far from Finland. So the idea that modest sets of reforms and expenditures or policies or things will keep you to Finland is a pipe dream. And blocking the innovative ideas because they don't look like established best practice will prevent you from discovering the way in which India can realize India's potential and become great on its own terms, which is, I think, what we all want. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Richard. It's a fascinating, extremely challenging presentation. And a civil indictment of the Indian Prince Service, to which I belong and many of the distinguished audience belong at one point of time or the other. Um, I'm sorry for your very grueling day today. I think I can only hope that from Delhi, Hyderabad is a much improvement with the was not. <laughs> And I hope you would extend your stay in order to enjoy the city and its hospitality and some of the nice things. Um, I met Professor Dan Richard uh, some three years ago at Cambridge Massachusetts. I was a riveted. You know what? But he left us tantalizingly in the books. No, he told us what to not work. I'm desperately eager to know what to do. There are some people who are going to listen. We may or may not be able to do much about it, but we are desperately eager to know. There is one gentleman there, a man with a, with a mobile phone there. He traveled 400 to 350 kilometers, 400 kilometers, 400 kilometers. He made his life's mission to improve the quality of school education at enormous personal cost. There are many people out here who want to do that. The state may not be doing it. The good news is a lot of people are engaged in in school education, they are putting in their talent, their time, their energy. I would like to say a glimmer of hope. So, shall we start off the discussion and could we force you, my apologies for not giving you much time, but this is so fascinating and so incredibly important that you know, until you get tired, we can probably go long enough. Let's not conclude very quickly because we need to really come to grips with this. So, we we'll just spend a couple of minutes as to what do you think can be attempted realistically? Then questions and microphones are directed. Thank you. What can be realistically attempted? Right. Sound, okay. Shoot long, sound. I think. Shoot long. Uh, I think what can be realistically mm. attempted is um, mm. is a set of is a set of. Uh, Mm -hmm. My wife is in the back. She can't hear. There we go. Okay. Um, <clears throat> what can be realistically mm -hmm. attempted is rather than trying to beat the turtle, create an environment in which relatively clear and coherent and achievable curricular objectives are set. The current curriculum is just not achievable in anything like the current circumstances. And continuing to pursue that will leave lots of kids behind. And so pursuing a relatively clear, simple objective, like every child read fluently by grade three, create support for those who want to opt into innovations to achieve that objective to be able to do it, which means freeing them from many of the policies that, while they prevent abuse, also prevent innovation. So creating a space in which, against a clear and coherent set and major set of objectives, people can innovate, they can try new things. They can say, I think this will work. And you would say, what do you need to make that happen? How to make that happen? Including backing the blood-sucking service functions off for a little bit. Right? Third, rigorous, constant learning from experience. You need to build a monitoring system, not to keep track of what was spent, 
but a monitoring system to keep track of what was learned. You should show up and you should say, what did you do? What happened? What did you learn? What are you going to do next? And I, I, I realize this might sound like really silly, but it's not in fact the way most organizations work. They say, what did you do with the money? Thanks. <laughs> did you comply with the regulations? Good. Right? And then fourth, you need to create a professionally motivated, horizontally network group of people who celebrate success. Because the way things in the heart scale is by experience and personal contact, not by direct. So rather than thinking that you're going to scale it by a top-down directive, you're going to scale it when people become converted to a new practice by seeing someone they know have success. And so you have to think, how do we connect the people so that they're having success? Now, that's a four-minute description. I can give a 40-minute description or a four-day seminar. But I think those are the key elements. You have to set some clear, coherent, achievable objectives that, again, which is very hard to do in education, because the minute you say, you can do this in education, people say, oh, but they need to learn about sustainability, they need to learn about this, they need to learn about that. And you have to be able to say, yeah, 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 but first they have to be able to read. You have to do that, right? So you have clear objectives, you have to free people up, and not everyone, you're not gonna turn the whole organization loose, you're not gonna say everybody does whatever they want, you're going to identify specific innovators and support them in pursuing that objective in and outside the government. You're going to have rigorous learning that might include the impact evaluation, but really includes monitoring in a way that it creates experiential learning, in a way that you can take and share with others an account of what they've done and what they've learned, and then create a horizontal network in which success is diffused so that people start adopting successes rather than waiting for it to go all the way up get enshrined into some directive and come all the way down to change behavior. Because in the end, like if you don't, you know, we have, a, we have a lot of models in the kind of training we do about state capability, and one of them is you can't juggle without the struggle. <laughs> Nobody has ever learned to juggle by getting a directive on the steps of juggling. Right? If you don't throw the balls in the air, drop them, pick them up again, throw the balls in the air, you don't learn, and so you have to create a network of people that look at other people struggling with the juggling and then start trying it themselves. I think those are the fundamentals of starting with the purpose driven revivification of the core around which the support can be seen as support rather than the support being as driving. This uh, horizontal network, yeah, you can do it from the citizens and public leaders. Are you thinking of teachers? Are you thinking of what is what are the I am thinking of a little of all, but I'm mainly thinking um I mean dentists. Dentists. Like dentists have a dental association. And the way new dentistry, at least in America, I don't know anything about dentistry in India, but dentistry in America is actually way better than it used to be. There's no like top-down organization of dentists. Every dentist works for himself, but they're horizontally networked. So they go to the, the trade fairs, they go to the dental association meetings, and there are suppliers and they're there that say, here's a new enamel, here's a new pick, here's a new x-ray machine, here's a better way to do things. So I'm thinking partly professionally networked teachers as opposed to vertically networked teachers, because again, vertically networked teachers often turned out to be obstacles rather than enhanced. But professionally, horizontally networked teachers, teachers learn from other teachers. Citizens can also be involved. Entrepreneurs can be involved. Private sector can be involved. So you can have, but it's, again, the emphasis is on kind of diffusion through learning by doing across a horizontal network, rather than waiting for it to go up and waiting it to come down, because you know, I've seen cascade training, and uh, it's very hard. It's very hard. Like the, 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 the person who believes in it teaches ten other people. Those ten other people who kind of maybe understood teach ten other people, and a thousand people get something they don't understand at all. So it's very hard to create vertically cascaded 
non-diffusion. Whereas in a network system, you can get quite rapid diffusion. Okay, thanks. Uh, yes. <laughs> so that was a very interesting presentation by you, uh, quite inspiring presentation. Uh, as I have understood from the presentation, you are suggesting uh, changes in the quality of education, you are also suggesting in the, the changes in the quality of teaching, you are also saying that because uh, of the poor uh, skill levels of the students, you are suggesting that they need to be uh, uh, mentored by uh, you know professional organizations or professional people who share the similar objective yeah. this is what you are so when we when we uh, summarize this uh, what you are saying in terms of the skill levels of the uh, students you are you are referring to their employability levels or are you referring to their uh, you know what is the net return on investment on education what is it that you are specifically uh, referring to so in your presentation so you take a few more questions then. When you are testing their, uh, you know, outcomes, you know, you gave an example of uh, you slept at 8.30 and got up at 5.30 or time everything. That is arithmetic. But the other one, are, it, are they in English language or are they in the mother tongue? I mean, what uh, this one not testing?